Good afternoon. I am Petra Jung and I'll be your host for today. As a member of the Launchworks and Co team um, of platform experts, I've been working very closely with Law, Benoit and the wider team over the last few weeks to curate, cu curate today's session. And I'm really thrilled to kick us off to an absolute star-studded lineup. Um, you'll be hearing from platform experts who will be exploring the future of digital platforms across three key dimensions, impact, regulation and governance. First off though, and setting the scene will be Law Claire Rillé, co-founder and CEO of Launchworks and Co, where she helps organizations design, scale and manage digital platforms. She's a former senior exec from eBay and was invited to join the top eight platform experts at the World Economic Forum in 2019 and is the co-author of Platform Strategy, How to Unlock the Power of Communities and Networks to Grow Your Business. We'll be starting shortly. Um, just a couple of reminders. Number one is, and I can see that you're doing this already, please do use um, the chat functionality, submit your questions. The team in the background will be reviewing them and we'll do our best to surface them throughout the course of the webinar to the relevant folks. Um, social media, we have a hashtag, hashtag platform leaders. Um, that's our handle for the event and for, for our um, initiative. Please use this when you post about uh, today's webinar. And um, other than that, I hope you are going to enjoy um, our very uh, carefully curated content. Enough from my side, and without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Law. Hi, thank you very much, Petra. Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here today and to welcome you to uh, the Platform Leaders 2020 event. We were initially planning to run this event physically, uh, but moving it online has actually helped us uh, uh, being able to provide this event in a safe way, but also uh, it's enabling us to connect with you all over the world. So if you're joining from Egypt, Brussels or Australia, <laughs> welcome. So now platforms have been in the news a lot of the last few weeks and months. Uh, only yesterday, Airbnb announced their IPO, uh, the European Union. Um, we've heard from them about Amazon. So, you know, lot, lots going on. And lots of questions. Should digital platforms be regulated? And if so, how? Um, how can platforms help the world become a better place? How can platforms uh, help with COVID and beyond? What constitutes a good platform? So these are all important questions and they are important because uh, digital platforms play an increasingly important role in our lives. In fact, a recent uh, study from McKinsey showed, showed that a third of all global transactions will be intermediated by platforms by 2025. And in fact, uh, you know, with the acceleration of digital uh, since the beginning of uh, that pandemic, I think we'll get there before then. So um, to understand the issues and shape the debate, we thought that uh, it would be a good idea to bring together uh, basically the different communities that are uh, building the future of platforms. And these are the communities of uh, practitioners, uh, policy makers and academics. Collectively, uh, these communities uh, in effect are building the future of platforms, but uh, they don't always talk to each other. Uh, and we think there's value in bringing them together um, so that there's you know, the exchange of best practice um, and uh, knowledge sharing. So on the practitioner side, it's the founders, it's the entrepreneurs, the investors, but also the managers, uh, perhaps working in corporate uh, companies, uh, building uh, complementary platforms. On the um, policy makers, it's the regulators, um, the um, politicians, the law, uh, makers, the competition authorities. And then finally, on the academic side, it's the professors, the researchers, the educators, and the thought leaders. And so today we're going to cover uh, three of the hottest topics uh, in the world of platforms. So we're going to talk about regulation, we're going to talk about governance, and we're going to talk about social and economic impact. Um, I'm very curious, actually, uh, to find out uh, from the audience uh, what you guys are working on right now. And um, if possible, it'd be a great, Robin, if we could actually show the poll. I've got a poll for you uh, with a few questions. 
So if you could answer the poll, um, very interesting in terms of in terms of the results. That's actually fairly fairly balanced at the moment. Thank you very much. I think it's it's very helpful for for us to understand, you know, what what your interests are. So, um, but you know, I've been talking for the last few minutes about platforms. Uh, but uh, what is a platform? Uh, there are lots of definitions, and uh, I remember that I asked once this question to one of my students, and uh, this is the answer I got: uh, <laughs> platform shoes. And yes, you know, uh, and these are Lady Gaga shoes. Uh, these are also platforms. So I promise today I'm not going to talk about shoes, uh, rather we're going to talk about platforms in the context of uh, the business model. And so a platform uh, is an organization creating value through the acquisition, the matching, and the connection of two or more customer groups to enable them to transact. And so, you know, and these are effectively, you know, the marketplaces of product and services, you know, app stores, uh, social networks, uh, content platforms, for example. So, but what do these platforms have in common? Uh, well, interestingly, you know, they really operate like ecosystems. They are not a linear, uh, they are open. So they are very different from the traditional linear businesses uh, that, that we know. Uh, what platforms do, effectively what they do is attract a critical mass of producers on one side and a critical mass of users on the other side. They match them in a way that is filtered, relevant, relevant and timely. They connect them to uh, remove the asymmetry of information. And ultimately, they enable them to transact, uh, which is really the raison d'etre of the platform. And that transaction there, you have an exchange of value, can be of a different nature. It can be a purchase, it can be a meeting, think about dating platform, platforms, it can be an exchange of information, it can be many things. And so what platforms do, they really orchestrate that ecosystem and really enable the co-creation of value between the participants. And um, they also need platforms, uh, some strategic enablers to really enable that co-creation of value like trust and governance that we'll talk about today. Okay, so uh, what does the program look like? Um, we effectively have three panels and uh, in terms of the format, um, so our wonderful moderators, um, Jennifer Lewis and Azim will introduce the speakers and then there will be short presentations and a a panel discussion. We'll have a short break of 10 minutes after the second panel. And then at the end, uh, Benoit Rayet will uh, wrap up the event and uh, do a summary of the key insights. Uh, a twist here is that um, during the event, uh, we have a very talented illustrator, Louise Plantin, who will effectively draw um, as we talk. And you'll be able to follow her drawings um, uh, in real time. And then during the, co the conference break, uh, what we show you will show you her drawings and scribbings uh, from the panel one and two. So uh, we're nearly about to go. Just one of thought, final thoughts for you. Uh, you know, platforms are really global and diverse by nature. And so we like platform leaders to reflect that. Uh, we like this community to be as global and diverse as possible. And this starts with uh, you know, more uh, diverse speakers, uh, certainly more women and more minorities. So you know, we're not there yet. Uh, we need your help for this. And so if you can help, you know, we are really looking forward to, uh, to hearing from you. Without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to, um, to Petra and, and the first panel. And thank you very much for being here. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Law. Um, this is an exciting content ahead of us. And for the avoidance of any doubt, I'm going to repeat, we are going to talk about platform business models, not fashion. Um, I am going to share with you our fantastic lineup um, of the first panel. Against the backdrop of the challenges that um, this year has already presented all of us, um, 
uh, platforms are playing an ever increasing social and economic role. Just think about the fundamental changes we've undergone in terms of how we interact, how we conduct business, how we shop for products and services, and even how we learn and study. And this is not just for young or old people in America and Europe and Asia, but for everyone everywhere. And our platform impact session will explore this topic in much more detail. Jennifer Schenker will be moderating this panel, and Jennifer is an award-winning journalist and the founder of The Innovator, and she's been a World Economic Forum Tech Pioneers judge for the last 20 years. Jennifer, without further ado, I'm handing over to you. Good afternoon. Hope you can see me. Um, uh, and thank you for the introduction, Petra. I'm um, uh, I'm very pleased to have with us uh, here today um, as panelists, Liebert uh, Algarik, uh, the Vice President of Marketing at Udemy, um, Joe Schorge, who is the founder and managing partner at Isomer Capital, and um, Arun Sandor Arajan, who's author of The Sharing Economy, and the Harold Price Professor of Entrepreneurship and Professor of Technology, Operations and Statistics at NYU Stern School of Business. Um, as Petra mentioned, we're here to talk about the social and economic impact of platforms. And I'd like to kick off our discussion um, with, um, by asking our panelists, um, what kind of impact COVID has had on platform businesses. And um, Joe, let's start with you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, just to introduce uh, myself and my business a bit, um, Isomer Capital is an investment firm. We invest in, in very early in big ideas, shall we say. So very early stage companies in a very broad mix. We have over 700 companies in our portfolio right now. So my lens and, and my uh, point of view on this discussion today is how these are performing as a, as a business. Um, we have, I, I took a look through our, our portfolio before the call, and we have about 44 companies who self-identify themselves as marketplaces of one form or another. Uh, I suspect we have a similar number, which are what I would call marketplace support. So providing the software that drives the marketplace or um, other other form of platform support. Um, interestingly, these are spread across 13 countries and they cut across pretty much every sector you can think about in business operation. So the question that all of us investors have been asking this year is how has COVID affected these businesses? Uh, I think as a headline, uh, my answer would be broadly in line with the sector they operate in. So on the two extremes, um, we have a business in, in travel and tourism. It's suffering, <laughs> and you can understand that. Um, it's a great business model. It had, uh, it had its best revenue month ever in January. It had its worst revenue month ever in March. Um, so that's a pretty clear picture uh, related to that sector. Likewise, on the other end, uh, businesses which are enabling the COVID period have done extremely well. So we've seen a lot of things uh, in e-commerce, in uh, the shift to home, so home improvement, um, art people want for home, all sorts of things you might not have thought about earlier this year have really prospered through COVID and particularly where uh, you weren't able to shop. <laughs> so people aren't able to go out for food. They aren't able to go out for um, things they need for home, they, uh, remote working, education, health, healthcare. So what I would say is that platform businesses have often had a slight advantage because they, of course, aggregate many options where you, you couldn't uh, go out to do your shopping, whatever that, sh I don't mean shops as retail only, but uh, platforms were able to deliver that at home. And so they're, they're prospering, uh, in the, in the main, aside from a couple of, of sectors, as I said. Thanks a lot. Um, I, I, Arun, I, I know you did a, a study on um, the impact on the restaurant business. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I'm sure. I'm glad to be joining this and uh, thanks uh, to um, the organizers. I mean, this is sort of a timely, 
a timely gathering and sort of a really important topic. Um, <clears throat> I think we um, often during a crisis, we see changes um, accelerated. And this, uh, this crisis is no exception. You know, it's a substantial crisis. And so the acceleration is quite substantial. But, you know, often um, the acceleration is not necessarily only in the technological change itself, sort of like, you know, technology aimed at addressing the crisis. I mean, we've certainly seen accelerated vaccine development and so on. But in sort of acceleration of changes that are ongoing because of prior technological change that suddenly sort of get a boost. And, you know, the restaurant industry is certainly um, a good example of this. Because, you know, because we were forced into certain kind of behavior changes, not being able to go and sit at a restaurant, um, having to order in, um, you know, this, this, this kind of behavior change forces us to try something new that already was around, but we maybe never got around to. And then as more and more people do that, that behavior then sticks afterwards. And so if you look at the numbers, I mean, my own study was uh, in collaboration with Uber Eats and, um, you know, pre and post lockdown. So like, you know, Feb 1st through March 15th versus, you know, March 16th through May 1st in New York City, for example, and sort of different windows, depending on like, you know, when cities lock down we saw a more than doubling of order volumes through the platform. Um, like, you know, if you compared pre and post pandemic. Um, and, you know, this is not an isolated, um, you know, this is not an isolated example. I was pouring through DoorDash's um, S1 filing um, on Friday, um, you know, they filed it to go public. And uh, they have documented a roughly doubling of um, like, you know, the gross order volume that is flowing through their platform in um, Q3 relative to Q2. I think it went up from 3 billion to 6 billion in gross order volume they fulfilled. And, you know, as Joe mentioned, while the travel sector might be taking sort of a short term hit, um, I actually think that what we're starting to see is the platform business model will dominate in the post-pandemic travel sector. I mean, you, again, you look, look at Airbnb's numbers for um, Q3 of 2020, they were up to 80%, over 80% of what they were in Q3 2019. So it's a very rapid rebound, much more rapid rebound than the hotels. Um, and so, you know, some of the platform models like the restaurants have certainly benefited because of interface shifts. You know, we are relying more on digital interfaces, certainly education, certainly um, like, you know, sort of food ordering, retail, um, all of these. But other platforms like Airbnb are going to benefit in the long run because of other related reasons. I mean, I think the single most important reason is that you know, we're going to have to rebuild trust in the familiar, right? You know, there's all these like meeting a friend, sitting at a restaurant, taking the subway, you know, um, sitting in your office, staying in a hotel room, going to the airport, all of these things that we didn't think twice about. We're going to now have to rebuild trust in these sort of experiences, like, you know, in this post pandemic era. And if you think about the set of people, the set of companies in the ecosystem that really know how to build trust in the unfamiliar or like, you know, trust in new experiences. It's the platforms in the short term accommodation business. It's Airbnb. And so I'm very optimistic about not just the platform businesses that have seen a positive shock to their system because of changes in interface and people staying at home. But I'm equally optimistic about those platforms that might have taken a hit early on, like Uber and Airbnb, but I think will come back stronger and end up with a much bigger pie uh, slice of um, like, you know, sort of the, the, the pie as it sort of regrows. Right. Thank you so much. Um, so, Lieber, let's start. Let's uh, turn to you now. And you know, from your perspective, you were operating a platform. How is your platform benefiting um, from this strange pandemic environment? Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm I'm really glad uh, uh, to be here and talk to you about uh, the the Udemy as a platform. 
Um, so just for context, for those who may not know about Udemy, uh, Udemy is a, a learning marketplace, online learning marketplace. Um, basically, what we do is we connect uh, real life experts with people who want to learn. So we have 57,000 instructors teaching over 130,000 courses in 65 languages. Today, we have 35 million students and 7,000 corporate um, customers who basically use our learning services to learn, uh, to upskill, right? So the, the world's changing very rapidly and both companies and uh, individuals need to upskill and reskill constantly. And Udemy is really in the middle of that. Um, when it comes to COVID, um, one of the challenges coming into 2020 for me as a marketer was how can I accelerate the awareness of online learning in the general population, right? So the reality of today, and, and, and sorry, Arun, that might be a bit controversial, but traditionally education is, was built for a world that no longer exists, right? Um, people need flexibility. They need access to uh, skills that they can apply today and tomorrow to their, to their jobs, right? And what happened with the shutdown of the economy, the inability to, uh, to really move around um, during, during the high uh, of, the, uh, of the pandemic was that people turned into learning. So we saw an acceleration of awareness and adoption of online learning. Uh, I, I, I generally say it's about five years into one, right? So we, we leapfrog five years of awareness, of adoption, of, um, of basically of usage of our platform in, in, in one. I'll give you some data. Um, we saw a spike of 425% in course enrollments. So we saw people from all over the world and, and we mapped out the lockdown dates to the spikes in traffic. And it's kind of beautiful to see how as soon as the lockdowns were implemented, we saw people turning into, um, uh, into the platform and, and starting to really think about, hey, what does that mean for me? How can I continue uh, evolving in my career? How can I make sure that I maintain and keep my job? If unfortunately uh, I was laid off, how do I skill up to make sure that I can find the next job, right? So, so we've seen um, the, and, and again, I'm talking about Udemy, but this is true for all at tech, right? So you've seen rounds and of announcements of uh, a lot of funding and a lot of new uh, startups uh, around ed tech that are popping up because the demand is is there and I truly believe that um, to what Arun was saying, right? There's a, a change in behavior that we've seen is is not only the fact that people are forced into um, into online learning is now that they've discovered that online learning is there, right? Then the benefits of asynchronous learning at any any point in time. I don't have to be physically stuck into a classroom, but I can actually learn on my couch. I can learn what I'm exercising. I can pretty much have the flexibility to build my own hours and really have access to people around the world. It's very much like this, right? So we're able now to have this conference. I'm in San Francisco. Some of you are in London. Some of you are in, in New York. And, and having this ability to connect is, is really important. So I believe that post-pandemic, this behavior will stick and the adoption of uh, online education, but all of kind of online services will continue to prosper and grow. Thank you. So now I'm gonna ask, um, and this is a question to any of the panelists who, who wish to answer. You know, we've, we've touched on uh, restaurants and food delivery, on travel and education. Beyond those sectors, what, which, uh, which other sectors do you see growing fastest post pandemic? Well, I can I can take a stab at a couple of other sectors. I think um, you know certainly we've touched on restaurants, but I I, I don't think that we've uh, unpacked just how deep the transformation of that industry will be. Um, I think that there's going to be a fundamental restructuring of the supply model there where today um, in the United States, at least maybe like a sort of small single digit percentage of, um, you know, food prepared by others is sold through platforms. 
um, we're going to be looking at a healthy double digit percentage of that um, number in a few years. And so this is almost a trillion dollar market in just the United States. But a lot of it won't come from sit down restaurants who are selling through the platform on the side. Um, it will come from dedicated supply infrastructure that has been built for platforms only. Cloud kitchen, sort of like, you know, both individuals renting space and sort of mass production through, you know, platform, you know, companies like McDonald's and so on. Um, I, I think you're going to see a parallel shift in local retail. And, uh, you know, this, this is sort of a, a missing piece of the retail transformation that we've seen um, induced by platforms over the last 25 years, right? Because most of online platform-based retail is the stuff is somewhere far away and it gets shipped to you. Um, we've had a little bit of grocery and, uh, you know, through Instacart and Walmart and Amazon and others, but I think the pandemic has laid bare the fact that um, a local business that relies on local customers does not have a digital interface to interact with them. And they cannot build this on their own. They can't go to Shopify and say, build me an online store. And so they're extremely well suited, like an Airbnb host is to offer a short-term accommodation business through a platform to attach to a platform for recommendations for customer relationship management, for maintaining that business continuity um, in the context of interruptions and also for that to sort of, so we're gonna see an ex a dramatic expansion in the number of small businesses that become omni-channel through a platform. And I'm not sure who this platform is gonna be. It could be Postmates or Uber Eats that are already starting to enter this space. It could be Instacart that started in this space. It could be Walmart that builds out its sort of local delivery infrastructure into, you know, and transforms itself into a platform. It could be a completely new player. But that's again, like, you know, sort of a multi hundred billion dollar sector where there is no clear platform leader. So it's certainly one that I see as being incredibly promising. I do have some other comments in response to Liebert on, you know, sort of the future of education, but maybe we'll save that for later. Okay. Um, I, I, I do have to say that I, I am sitting in my NYU office right now, and I'm in my 12th week of teaching students in person. So, you know, it's it's not like, you know, it's not all, all has not been lost as yet, you know. <laughs> Okay, so uh, you you outlined, you know, uh, I think you did a great job outlining some of the opportunities as business, more business shifts online, including local business and this, and, and the fact that we don't have clear winners in these spaces yet. So let's, let's talk about where the opportunities are, not just for platforms, but also um, for traditional businesses to maybe get into the platform game. Um, and, and here, Joe, I'll turn to you and, and um, you know, maybe we can talk about um, how um, Miracle helps uh, some of these traditional businesses to, um, to become uh, omni-channel uh, players. Sure, sure. I'm can, can I take a moment and react to Aaron's uh, comments as well? Which you were, of course. Which I thought were interesting. Um, to me, when I look at, at our existing businesses, what's very clear is this interface change that, that uh, it's not the wording I've used, but I think we're going to use it going forward now. So lots of businesses, uh, platform businesses are prospering that you wouldn't have predicted earlier this year. So for example, a, a funny but real example, people are home and they're looking at the wall that they should have painted a few years ago and thinking, oh, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that now. And, and so a business out of France called Mano Mano is doing extremely well because um, that has driven huge uptake in, in do-it-yourself at home improvement. So lots of this interface shift is happening and that's, you name the sector, I can tell you a business, literally every segment. What's not clear to me yet is what behaviors will stick after. Uh, you know, we're certainly seeing a short-term win on this interface shift, but it's unclear to us how much of that um, will be sticky behavior and how much will people go back to their, their local shop, which doesn't have a digital interface. What's for sure is that the, the competition landscape is changing as, as a result of this. And so to come to your question about a, a larger company, 
we work with a number of, of companies um, that invest with us in order to figure out how to engage with these new businesses. And I would classify the kind of engagement levels as, as three levels. The first one is, let me try to understand what's going on in my sector. So research, study, if I have a window onto the technology startups, I can figure out maybe the trends in two to five years, say, as these businesses grow up. What we didn't anticipate is COVID would, um, as Liebert said, it would take five years and put it into one. So I totally agree. That's a wonderful surprise. But you know, one level for, and, and I think most traditional companies that, that I know are, are on that level at least. How do we understand incorporating platforms in our work or, or, or dealing with them? Part two is engage. So either start to sell through a platform business that's in your sector or, or buy. Um, we spoke a lot about consumer consumer facing businesses, which are visible and obvious, but there's an equally large segment, which is B2B. So supply chains are being heavily affected on the back end where you, you're sourcing materials through uh, platforms with, with suppliers in other parts of the world. That is uh, equally big, but less visible. Um, and then also you can engage with platforms by investing in them and learning how they work and playing an active role. And then the third level of engagement is, is launching a platform within your company um, for a particular product line or to, you know, to aggregate demand and supply. Uh, and, and so you, you raise a good point, which is that's, a, that's hard. <laughs> that's a very difficult thing to figure out the competitive landscape um, in an area you haven't competed in before. And so there are some shortcuts. Um, Miracle, as you point out, is a software company that, that is kind of um, platform as a service. So you don't have to write your own software. Um, they can get you up and running in a matter of months. Uh, and, and that is one of a new range of businesses offering to help traditional industries make use of, of, of platform um, methods. Thanks. I mean, yes, I think that, you know, there are a number of, uh, of, of, of examples of um, startups who are helping uh, traditional companies uh, to try and more quickly move into the platform business. Uh, Rails Bank out of the UK is offering um, like banking as a service with uh, better interfaces and, and, and help to help banks who want to um, you know, become more digital more quickly. Um, and then there's an insurance company out of Hong Kong that is, is offering a similar kind of thing to, to insurance companies now. But figuring out, for traditional companies, figuring out where to position yourself in the landscape, who to partner with, and how to partner can be really tricky, especially when we're seeing some of these platform players, like, say, Grab, um, in Southeast Asia that is just um, expanding into um, many different verticals almost simultaneously. Um, and of course, everyone is aware of Amazon and Amazon has just finally like uh, uh, verified all those rumors that it is indeed going to be go into the pharmacy uh, business. So, um, so the, the traditional companies feel more and more pressure to react to that and it's difficult it's difficult to know exactly how to, to approach this or whether it makes sense to partner. Um, in the case of uh, Singapore, they're, they're now um, issuing five digital banking uh, licenses. And uh, this has given rise to um, alliances between unlikely bedfellows. You have gaming companies partnering with supermarkets and um, use online use car marketplaces to become banks and <laughs> banking platforms. Um, people that you never in a million years would think. So, you know, how, how do you see those partnerships forming and how do, how do traditional companies make sure that they don't get the short end of the stick? Aaron, would you like to take that? Um, sure. Um, you know, I think that this is, uh... This, this, this kind of diversification is far easier for platforms 
Um, it's just sort of a natural part of their growth strategy. I mean, we've been aware of this phenomenon of envelopment, right? Where you gain dominance in one sector and then you sort of move into adjacent sectors. And so what I think what Grab is doing is um, sort of, you know, consistent with the time-tested playbook of, um, you know, taking your power in one industry and moving it into adjacent ones. And because these platforms are scaled without mass, expansion into adjacent sectors is easier. You know, in many ways, this will be accelerated also by the pandemic because as Uber has discovered, diversification has sort of served them well. Moving into Uber Eats certainly sort of smoothed out their revenue numbers um, this year as their ride hail business sort of got hit and they didn't have to you know, they didn't go bankrupt like the rental car companies that are sort of carrying the costs of having those cars and not being able to service them. Um, but, you know, the, I, I, I think where the traditional companies who are going to be a lot more cautious about this kind of diversification for a couple of reasons, right? I mean, one is that um, they think much more carefully about, you um, you know, sort of brand and reputation implications of being in a sector that they are not leaders in. You know, if you've built a strong brand in the insurance sector or in the travel sector, and you're suddenly jumping into an adjacent, I mean, you know, your brand dilution or your brand reputational damage, if you don't actually sort of deliver well, um, that's sort of an additional concern that they have. They also may have, um, you know, sort of a more measured approach to governance and to thinking about sort of the regulatory issues in that sector, whereas platforms have sort of this move fast and, or at least platforms used to have this move fast and break things um, approach, which, um, you know, Facebook has sort of, you know, succeeded very well at, right, and moving fast and breaking things. So, um, so I, I, I'd say that, you know, the reticence of a traditional corporate to move too fast into adjacent sectors may actually be, may not be a bad thing strategically, because I think we're in a phase of platform expansion where the low hanging fruit are gone, right? And any new sector that is going to sort of be transformed by platforms is going to have a strong physical world component, is going to have, and we've already seen this with Uber and Airbnb over the last 10 years relative to Facebook and Google, like, you know, 10 years before that, right? It's a much harder road to hew. And, you know, um, like a couple of years ago, I collaborated with uh, Michael Jacobides, who I know is on the next panel, and Marshall Van Alstein from BU, and we, we, we all wrote a World Economic Forum report together about different aspects of uh, platform platform businesses, growing a platform, you know, sort of ecosystem building, especially from the traditional corporate view and governance. And, you know, it, it led me to conclude that a big source of competitive advantage for traditional corporates in the future is going to be because they understand governance better and because they are more measured in their sort of expansion and into sort of like, you know, because the sectors that we're going to go into um, are not going to be ones where moving fast and breaking things is going to be a viable long-term strategy. So if you've got sort of good experience with corporate governance and you think about things from a more measured point of view, just one other point, which is sort of tangential because it relates to your question about like sort of, should I partner? Should I do this myself? Should I... <laughs> You know, I've, I've always maintained that it's not a good idea for a traditional company to simply become a provider on a platform. You know, we saw Gap do this with Amazon 20 years ago, and it didn't really help them. You know, if at all you do part, you know, it's got to be in a substantial partnership with an equity stake or preferred placement. And even that, I, I argued very uh, vociferously against NYU joining Coursera eight years ago. Because um, to me, it was just like, hey, why, why, why do you want to build this platform that is, you know, sort of building its reputation on the brands of sort of like, you know, well, why are you setting up, setting yourself up for failure, right? And, you know, the, the reality has been different, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's a trade-off between, um, you know, we're, 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 I, I think what companies often forget 
is that in this desire to move rapidly and to sort of enter this platform world, they forget about the advantages that they have, like, you know, the brand advantages that they have, the governance advantages that they have, the financial advantages that they often have, and they don't strike as good a deal with the platform as they're sort of partnering with them as they should. Um, and, you know, cause the, the, the thing to remember is that again, like, you know, we're not talking about a Facebook, Google platform world. We're talking about a physical world platform world. And so corporates have more to offer than they may realize. And this could cause them to sort of be able to strike better deals with these platforms as they think about partnering. As you were talking, I was thinking about the um, AOL Time Warner deal yes. <laughs> as a, as an example. Um, but also, you know, in addition, you made some great points about um, you know the strengths that traditional companies have, and I think one additional one is the deep roots that they have in the community or countries where they are, and even their importance to the economy. And so, um, you know, whereas I don't know uh, a, a New York City uh, might you know, clash with Airbnb or Uber um, in Germany, you know, they're going to, they're going to move to help uh, support the automakers or the heavy manufacturing. So, um, so that those good, good and positive ties with government, I, I think can be helpful as well. Um, so, um, Liebert, let me ask you, what, you know, do you have a view on whether all traditional companies should try um, uh, be thinking about adopting platform business models? Yeah, uh, and I, I will provide a, a slightly different point of view to, to what Aaron mentioned, right? Although all, all the points he made are very, very fair, right? So each company needs to understand where they're, they're strong. What, what, what has been happening for the last 20 years is the digital transformation. And it's still surprising and shocking to me talking to different um, practitioners in different, in different uh, organizations, how far off big traditional and even small traditional companies that are rooted in, in the physical world are away from digitalization, right? I was just participating in a panel a couple of months ago and questions I was getting from some of the uh, the, the, the people who were attending were, hey, how do I convince my board or my CEO to adopt digital um, products, right, to, to digitalize, right? And I know that th this, is, this is a tension that exists today. So, so my point of view here is like, yes, obviously you need to root your business on uh, and, and look at the strengths and do not sell yourself short. I, I completely see that point. But the reality is that business need to realize and be very aware of um, what is their business model? What is their, What are they strong at? And what are the things that they're not going to be able to move fast enough to get at, right? And that's where disruptive business models will help with, right? And having an, an alliance and a partnership. And again, if you talk about the top big mammoth companies, I get the point, but there's a lot of companies, small companies, medium-sized companies that can benefit and are benefiting today from the synergies of partnering with Platinums. It gives them faster access to market. It, it, it makes their business uh, digitalized where they're rooted into uh, the physical world. And especially in, in today's uh, world where, where we're seeing this shift in behavior uh, that, yeah, uh, and I agree with Joe, we don't know how much of that's gonna stick, but this has been a fundamental shift, right? Uh, is it gonna be completely uh, uh, as it is today in COVID, but but a, a big percentage gonna stay uh, is gonna stick around. So that's my point of view. So, so I think companies and and companies who are not uh, do not have the capabilities are um, more physically re uh, uh, rooted and don't have the capa the capabilities of moving fast. They need to think uh, about a hey, what value can. Uh, they get from these partnerships on, on, on the platforms, right? And that comes from a guy who's worked in digital platforms his whole life, right? Okay. And so, so how do they get the balance right? Because a lot, um, a lot of big companies have watched the platforms take, you know, have a winner-take-all strategy. 
Um, and, and a lot of these companies are used to that sort of competitive mindset as well. So even if they can convince their board that they should develop a platform model, the first reaction is, yeah, but we want to control it. So if they do that, if they go into platforms with that kind of uh, an attitude, then their competitors are not going to want to join the network and they're not going to create as strong of an ecosystem as they as they might. So what, you know, can we give some good examples of rules of the road? And that's to anyone who wants to, to, to answer. Um, I, I'd love to comment. I'm not sure I have a preset rules of the road, um, but I, I wish I did. It's a great idea. Uh, maybe, maybe the LaunchWorks team have it already. Um, I was thinking as Aaron was talking, um, sometimes in the rush to accelerate, um, we're forgetting kind of normal business rules. So just because a platform is successful and working doesn't mean that its brand and value proposition aligns with your brand and value proposition. So that, you know, something clearly to manage there that you may want to adopt that kind of platform mentality, but your brand position in the market, um, maybe the you have a premium pricing and the platform is a low price platform. And that you know, that's common and that's normal business. Um, the other thing I would think about is channel conflicts. You don't want to sell at one price on one platform and a different price on a different retailer channel or whatever. And that's just normal traditional thinking. That, that's, that's not different. Um, to, to, you know, make a real example, we, uh, you, you brought up food delivery. So we hear Michelin starred restaurants don't necessarily want to be on Deliveroo next to the local pizza shop yeah you know their value proposition they're <clears throat> i mean they're you know it's very different so guess what there are other platforms for that more premium uh, segment and i i believe that this the over time the platforms will segment in the way that traditional businesses have. so it might not be winner takes all but it might be a few winners take all I think that's a great note for us to end on that, um, that, you know, we're going to see different platform models emerging um, and that, um, that companies have to keep an open mind and, um, and, and develop the right rules of the road. Um, I want to give a big thank you to um, our panelists um, for, and thank you to the audience for joining us uh, via Zoom. Thank you uh, <clears throat> to our first panel. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Arun, Joe, and Liebert. It's a fascinating debate. I could easily listen to you um, for a lot longer. Um, I'm going to do one sneaky thing and um, have one key takeaway that I'm preempting. So the influence and reach of platform business models um, will definitely continue to grow exponentially. I think the flavor in which we're going to see this uh, grow uh, might differ from region to region and vertical to vertical as well. We are going to change gear a little bit and we are going to start with our, uh, with our second um, panel uh, talking about platform regulation. And this is far from dry and boring with the ever growing impact and importance of platform business models. Regulation and competition are actually, uh, competition law have become real topics. And we all know about uh, the discussion around data privacy. Um, our platform regulation panel will explore the latest thinking of EU and UK policymakers and platform leaders. We are in the extremely capable hands with Lewis Crofts, editor in chief of the leading news provider MLEX, um, now part of. Lexis Nexus, who is going to moderate this panel. Um, Lewis, the virtual stage is all yours. So thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the um, invitation to uh, moderate this panel. Um, this is gonna look at the regulatory landscape, which has been uh, in flux for a while. Um, I think it's moved generally from a uh, feeling of, isn't it great to have all this in innovation and these um, tools and products and services brought to our door, often for free, to uh, concerns about the size of some of these companies, to what happens with our data, to access to markets, to market entry and so forth. And this is posed questions for competition lawyers, competition regulators, also for privacy regulators. We've seen GDPR and, and you know, big leaks hitting the front pages about what happens to our data. 
uh, but also deeper questions about you know what it means to be a consumer or a citizen or a business. So it's been a really interesting time for the last five, six years, and the panel that we've got um, should give us some fascinating insights into that. Um, we've got Professor Michael Jacobides, who was mentioned on the previous panel from the London Business School. We've got Oliver Bethel, who's head of competition at, at Google, who's lived through some of um, the uh, major cases of the last few years. And Tom Smith, who's the director of legal at Competition and Markets Authority, which is the UK uh, regulator, which has also been at the forefront of some of the thinking on how to handle these, these questions. What we're going to do is we're going to hear briefly from each of them um, in that order, and then we'll um, kick off the discussion. So, Michael, over to you. Thank you very much. And what I'd like to do, as I am not a regulation chap, uh, but I was drawn to regulation precisely because I think that it is uh, a very important topic that is going to reshape the way that we compete, is share a little bit uh, some thoughts. So whistle stop tour of what's happening, um, as I've now uh, started getting a regulatory hat as well uh, in uh, Europe. And what you will see is that in 2019, we had um, a bunch of fairly important um, studies um, in the US, the Stigler Center study, the Stigler report in the UK, we had the Furman report uh, by the Treasury and in the EU, uh, their own report on digital data. Uh, and of course, we started having a number of interesting cases uh, that uh, were either 2019 or 2020, including the uh, big case uh, against Google um, in the United States that is starting to say, well, you know what, we have a problem here. And one of the parts of the problem is that the traditional tools that we have don't quite work. Uh, so the issue that we've had uh, is that we have seen that there are, that platforms create bottlenecks. Uh, and it is easy to see that the traditional companies like yeah, Accor that we may teach uh, at that have half a million people have got less money than uh, the small Amsterdam firm of Booking.com and all of that because of these wonderful platform effects that everyone uh, uh, here knows. But I think that even more uh, the concern is the shift in terms of the power of big tech and the fact that COVID-19, if anything, uh, has increased their strength, certainly as this can be witnessed by the value in terms of market civilization and the extent of verticals that they're um, uh, involved in. Um, if we get the time, it'd be fun to speak about how economic nationalism and uh, industrial policy is starting to find an interesting ally uh, with competition policy, uh, but uh, um, that's a really huge topic of conversation. Now, the challenge, of course, is the traditional tools of regulation have looked at all problems. The canonical problem is, how do I increase my margin by reducing uh, supply? And we can define the markets, and we knew how to do that. And we had all kinds of lovely tests, SNPs, and the rest of it, and uh, all kinds of technical analysis that have kept competition lawyers and economists happily busy on the courts, uh, making a bit of side money for a long time. Now, the problem, of course, is that many of these things don't quite work when it comes to networks and uh, platforms. Now, in platforms, people said, oh, it's all about um, network externalities. And what happens is that the value of the network increases uh, non-linearly in the number of people who use it, which is mm, partly right, but mostly incorrect because people don't really care in most of these platforms whether someone else is on the platform. And then you have all kinds of interesting varieties, same side, other side, and mostly you have much more competition than people would have thought. Uh, so if you look at what the evidence uh, shows, um, having looked uh, with some uh, colleagues in a recent SMR, you look at what happens and you actually see there's a fair amount of competition. So these platforms and ecosystems, well, some of them never take, take all, others win it all temporarily, many of them find fork in the road. And this idea that you just get scale and then you own the economy is simply not quite empirically right. So what is this concern about? Well, I think that the concern here is that we do have some, um, some issues. Now, 
there is contestability when there's clever strategy, which is the good news here. So consider what happened in China, for instance, uh, you have the traditional dominant firm, which is Alibaba, second firm with JD.com, Pinduoduo out of nowhere came to challenge the position of the number two. How did they do it? They did it by gamifying the experience of shopping and offering a new value proposition, suggesting that if there is good strategy, there can be some contestability. Now, this is on the good news, but the problem is that we are all starting to be beholden to the devices that we have, and that creates a lot of dependencies. Now, not only that, but you also have a few very important firms, and I'm starting with the Chinese one just to be politically correct because we speak about the American firms all the time, um, uh, the biggest IPO that never quite was yet because the Chinese authorities are starting to get antsy about it as well, um, which is uh, the ant group uh, from Alibaba that tries to envelop everyone. And why is this a problem? It's a problem because all of a sudden we start thinking about how people really uh, shop and how people really behave. Uh, so the problem uh, that we've got, um, that's illustrated by uh, what Dick Thaler, who took the Nobel Prize in economics three years ago, uh, said, and these are the two quotes that Google gave me when the day that he got the Nobel Prize, is that we're lazy shoppers and there are firms that create the default and the default wins. And that's a problem because competition gets dampened. And now I think the regulators are starting to say, what the heck do we do with that? Here we go to platforms and ecosystems. What's the problem? The problem is that we have companies, the big companies that we care about, that do two things. They are multi-product uh, ecosystems, i.e. they bring a number of different products together, and they engage multi-actor ecosystems, i.e. they create platforms through which they find complementers. Why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because what you want to do as a massive firm is to lock people in, and Google has done it very cleverly, by expanding into the combination of things that gives it all the information that it can sell to the uh, people that sell advertising that fill up its coffers by ensuring that you have all of these convenient factors that it can then monetize. And equivalently, Apple says, let me create all these things together. And by the way, the more I broaden this sort of multi-product salami, the more I'm going to be relying on platforms that also have multi-party people. And the stronger that I become in this dimension, the more I can squeeze the other guys more than I actually should. So we now start saying, oh boy, these guys perhaps need to be looked at because they have the power to really, really squeeze um, uh, complementers and to lock in customers, neither of the two are good for competition and a number of other topics that we can't uh, quite look at. So now we've got this great new era where we're looking at things like gateways and um, the gatekeepers uh, because some platforms and ecosystems are stronger iPhones. Well, if you've got an iPhone, you're not going to also switch to uh, an Android. So if you're a company like Tinder and you want to have a platform for people who date, you need to do what iPhone says, because otherwise everyone with an iPhone is out of your potential sphere. So you now start seeing the way that the different platforms and ecosystems um, uh, operate. Some have power, others do not. Unfortunately, Uber or Lyft doesn't. And by the way, all this story about diversification that you heard earlier on, it's not just that they go to another vertical. They try to create the optimal length to lock customers in. And that's why Grab went into financial services in Indonesia and Malaysia, because that was much more sticky than rights. Rights will never pay themselves. A bundle that makes people sticky will allow them to pay themselves. When that becomes a gatekeeper, what's anti-competitive? This is the stuff that is up for grabs. We need to have new tools, which is the fun stuff. We need to have new tools, which is the scary stuff, because we don't have them yet. And we're already speaking about regulating as we are looking at the inadequacies of some of the existing ways that we have looked at the world. So it's fascinating. I think that the reality is, if you look at what's happening in Europe, um, that the world is changing. There are a number of interesting questions. And to go back to my starting example, the question of scope. Are we okay with these companies that build these ever-growing salamis? Healthcare is the big contested area, and Fitbit and Google is a good example of that as well. Uh, you've got the story not only of the platform and the complementers, but also learning about people, and that's uh, AI uh, and its use, 
data and its use absolutely massive in terms of both within and across ecosystems. And that's where lots of the fights are, both regulation and non-regulation, iOS 14, cookie-less future, all kinds of fun stuff. Do we allow MNAs that uh, suck ecosystems and platforms out like WhatsApp and Instagram? Should we have prevented that in order to make more competition within it? And should we think that ecosystems like MA is a way to grow non-organically that should be looked at? So lots of things, I think lots of discussion, lots of metaphysical questions, but also pragmatic stuff that you will hear. So let me stop here after I gave you some sense of the conceptual bit, because I'd like to hear much more from the people who are involved in either doing it, like uh, Ole, um, uh, who's going to tell us what the uh, challenges are and how to think about fairness from Tom. Ollie, over to you. Thanks a lot, Lewis. Thanks a lot, um, Michael. Can you hear me? Can you give me a thumbs up? Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, uh, as Lewis says, I uh, run Google's EMEA competition practice. So I have a bit of uh, experience of the Google cases in particular, and an eye um, on regulatory reform, I think, is, is an area where we're paying a lot of attention at the moment. And I'll give you some thoughts on this. I think that. Um, Michael actually, as he closes, puts things very well for me. There, there are two things that I like to focus on in my introductory remarks. First of all, why do I think that this kind of forum is particularly unique and important, this discussion we're having today with, with the people who are listening to us today? And then I'm going to just focus on two areas where, uh, from a practical perspective, where I would encourage um, platform owners, platform developers, aspiring platform leaders to be paying particular attention as regulation is form, formed and it evolves in the coming months. And, and why is that important? In a nutshell, as Michael quite rightly says, we've done a lot of metaphysics. Um, this kind of forum is a, is a change of scene, for, for certainly for me, and I suspect for my co-panelists. Typically, we're talking about the kinds of regulatory issues that have been touched on by, uh, by Michael uh, uh, with an audience of competition lawyers and, and, and economists. And to be very frank, that is at the metaphysical, somewhat macro level. We talk in general terms about platforms. We talk about certain types of practices, industry level observations, but with the new rules coming and they are coming, uh, we need to move to the micro. And it is people who are coming together in this type of forum, I strongly believe, who are going to need to contribute to that debate. What will the rules mean in practice? How will they apply to our businesses, to your businesses, to the businesses you aspire to grow? To, 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 to what will they cost you in terms of product development delay? Legal fees, dare I say, econ, OC fees. Michael quite ni nicely mentions the, 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 the side hustle. It's there. How will you manage that? How much regulation will be helpful for you and your business? Where will there be opportunities? Uh, where, where do you look for the opportunities? Where should the rules focus and how do we make these manifest? So I think those are all questions that are very, very important. The drafters have the, the pen in their hand. They're dipping their virtual quills in the virtual ink. We need to contribute. We need to have very specific, fact-specific, evidence-specific discussions about what these kinds of questions will mean in practice. Um, and then I think this is, is, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak today because I think this is a great opportunity to talk, as Michael also says, about the details. Um, so two areas where, in my very briefly in my remarks that I'd like to focus on two areas where I think that, that uh, those of you who are in this position, who are developing platforms, ought to pay particular attention. First of all, who is in scope? This is saying like a, a, some glib comment, but it's important. The word platform, if you attend the conferences that Lewis and Michael and, and Tom and I attend, the word platform is used a lot, um, but it's a bit like lockdown. Right? Everyone uses it, but everyone has slightly different versions of what it might mean. So having a, a, a clear concept of what we mean when we talk about platform or gatekeeper or system, a systemic actor or bottleneck, all expressions that are used quite liberally amongst those thinking about new legislation, it is important that we understand what that means because it will be the entry condition for the new regulatory regime. Um, there is a tendency, I would say at the moment, to talk about what gatekeeper is uh, naturally, by reference to a set of particular businesses, because we are aware of GAFA, we are aware of what the big companies are doing. So what's a gatekeeper? Well, it's what those large companies are doing. But as Michael has also said in his opening remarks, those companies operate in various different ways. There are certain parts of their businesses that perhaps do satisfy some of those criteria, some of those traditional criteria that you might think of when you're trying to identify a gatekeeper, others don't. We talk about app stores, we talk about cloud infrastructure, operating systems. So we have some ideas of who is within the set, 
but I respectfully submit perhaps a little less work has been done on what are the attributes that give one uh, the, 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 the qualify one as a member of the set. Why does that matter? If we know who's going to be in there, why does that matter? Well, this is a snapshot of today. Regulatory reform, the, the, the rubber will hit the road in the next couple of years, most likely, and they will apply to the businesses that evolve over the next five to 10 beyond. So we need to have a set of criteria that define the access, the, the, the access conditions to the gatekeeper rules that are clear, that can accommodate new types of business. There'll be some attributes that I think we can probably agree on, size of user base, not decidedness, ease of switching, but the question I think for you, platform developers, platform owners, uh, aspirational platform leaders, as I say, is whether the attributes that the legislators are considering today are clear enough. Will they give you the certainty for you to understand whether your new invention, your new platform is in or out? If not, do you accept some degree of discretion as people choose who is going to be in or out of this new, this new classification? Point one. Point two of two. What kind of evidence distinguishes competitive disruption from distortion of competition? Now, again, I think it's very important to, to speak to people who are building platforms when you think about this idea, um, because I know for many of you, as with Google, the features that define your platform will not be fixed. And when you think about how you're entering or expanding into different markets, you'll essentially be looking across different feature sets. That's essentially how people move into different spaces. Uh, it's not a decision to launch product X and, and, and build, incorporate it into that product Y. Typically, these are features that are built on an existing uh, feature set. So that's certainly how Google operates. And the hope of, of, of all of us is to disrupt, to be quite frank, to bring competition to markets where incumbents are not innovating as quickly as they could be. And the new regulatory frameworks that we're thinking about, that we're discussing on this panel, and that, that, that are very hot within our world, the competition community, are designed to filter. They're designed to filter the product decisions, your decision to launch a particular new feature, the, the, the type of feature launch that is going to have a detrimental effect on competition from the ones that will not. And I think that raises some important questions for people to consider now. How do we define those trade-offs? What are the types of evidence that are informing your decisions when you think about the, the trade-offs that uh, lead to a product launch? What kinds of integrations do you think are typically bad? Can we identify those? Is there a way of saying that there are some certain types of things that we would do as a platform owner that on the face of it, we don't need to assess the impact. We don't need to understand what it does or whether there's any justification. We can we recognize it as being a bad thing. It's a very timely and important question. It's very fact specific. And I think that uh, it is people in this forum who are best placed to answer that with, with real evidence based on the way that you develop products. I'm going to stop there. That's a very quick sort of the, 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 the two topics I wanted to raise and uh, that I think are very important as we're thinking about um, how we can provide value in this debate, particularly this forum. Um, look, I think just in closing, I think it is crucial that we move to fora like this to discuss how the rules will apply in practice. Um, I think it will make the difference between red tape and green shoots. It will mean the difference between successful regulatory innovation and unsuccessful regulatory innovation. And with that, I, I stop. Lewis, thanks for the time. Thanks. Thanks, Ollie. Tom, over to you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tom. Um, I work at the Competition and Markets Authority, uh, the CMA. And as many of you know, we've been doing a lot of hard looking at digital markets recently. Um, our remit is to make markets work well for consumers um, by promoting competition and innovation. Um, quite right, uh, I'm, I'm probably meant to disagree with Donnie more, but I, I thought he was spot on uh, when he was talking about uh, uh, green shoots rather than red tape. Um, that's certainly what we're aiming at. Um, so I'll give you just a very brief rundown of our work so far. Um, in July, we published a very big wadge of paper in the market study report, which was a report into the ad fund platforms, that's Google and Facebook, um, mission um, to, uh, to good effect, we think. Um, we used our new data science unit to crunch the data so that we are, and we crunched kind of billions of lines of data to, to really produce some facts where, where to, to try and drill down, like Ollie was saying, actually, where previously it was all quite theoretical. Um, we, what we found was that a, a company like Google's done had huge benefits for, for society, for consumers, 
and uh, we certainly do not want to dampen any innovation. In fact, what we want to do is incentivize even more in innovation. Um, Michael ran through, I thought very well, uh, the, uh, the some of the concerns that uh, certainly chime with what we wrote about in our report. That we did, we found new challenges, like Michael was saying. Um, old regulatory uh, price controls are not exactly going to be the way that uh, that are going to succeed here. We found network effects. We found a lack of transparency. We found vertical integration leading to conflicts of interest. We found uh, unsurmountable data advantages amongst the platforms. We found barriers to entry. Um, and as Michael said, we found that defaults have a very large power over consumer behavior. So we recommended to government that we set up a new regulatory regime, which is a, a pretty big thing to be recommending. It's not something we do every day, but we found the, that these are uh, new challenges and existing tools are too slow. Uh, to prevent com competitive harm uh, happening. Um, a big case like uh, like uh, one of the Google cases in Brussels uh, takes the best part of a decade to complete. Um, and they cannot intervene before the harm happens. They can only come along afterwards. Um, what we need is a process that can intervene quickly um, and that can uh, be expert enough to make the complex trade-offs that are, that are involved here. Um, important considerations rub up against each other, you know, privacy versus competition or a short-term innovation against um, a kind of long-term level playing field where the, where the, let the best company win. Um, and if we have an expert body there, we can tweak the remedies over time uh, so they can be properly tested. We can do the A-B testing of any choice screens or whatever. Um, we can collaborate closely with the, uh, with the gatekeepers and with the wider industry. Um, and we can have, like I say, the, the right people doing it, people who understand the industry. So what do we propose? We proposed, uh, proposed uh, three limbs, but well, sorry, two limbs, and then another one we're considering. Uh, the first one is a enforceable code of conduct. So we would designate a platform as having strategic market status, um, only if that platform has substantial and entrenched market power over businesses seeking access to consumers and over those consumers. Um, and it would require the company to occupy a strategic position in the UK economy. Um, another point Ollie quite rightly made is that um, we need to be clear who's uh, who's in in scope, who's in the firing line, and who's not. Um, one thing that could happen that could work there um, would be a jurisdictional uh, revenue threshold. Um, if set at the right level, that would show that the vast major the vast majority of companies would know that they're not falling in scope of this uh, regime. And if uh, set with uh, reference to UK revenues, it could also provide certainty to um, foreign companies that have a limited presence in the UK, knowing that they're not going to come into scope. So each uh, SMS firm would have their own code of conduct. Um, some of them might be quite similar, but they would be bespoke for each firm because as, as Oli again, <laughs> sorry, I'm agreeing with Oli again, uh, they are all, all very, uh, very different from each other and they, they uh, you can't just lump. You know, Apple in with Facebook or whatever. Um, so the new regulator, the Digital Markets Unit, uh, would have the power to suspend, block, and reverse decisions of the SMS firms and to order conduct to bring them into compliance with the code. Um, interim measures would be available to, uh, to, to kind of hold the ring while an investigation was going on so that serious harm could not materialize uh, while the DMU was investigating. Um, so that's the code of conduct. The second limb is the pro-competitive interventions. Um, this, uh, so where the code of conduct manages the market power and seeks to mitigate its effects, the, the second limb would seek to address the source of the market power to boost competition and make sure uh, innovation flourishes. Uh, we came up with some examples of pro-competitive interventions that we think need serious uh, consideration. For example, uh, mandating interoperability between our services. Uh, restricting the use of default positions, giving consumers greater control over their data, um, mandating data silos within large firms, and, and possibly mandating competitors' access to platforms' data. Um, we're not saying all those need to be uh, put in place tomorrow. We're saying they need to be considered and the DMU needs to have the power to put them in place if the, if the case is made for them. Um, the third, uh, the third uh, aspect is merger control that's al already been touched upon uh, briefly. We're considering whether um, 
gatekeeper firms, SMS firms, should be subject to increased scrutiny of their acquisitions. There's been, as, as many of you know, there's been widespread concern about the sheer volume and uh, nature of the uh, acquisitions being done by the SMS firms, by the big by big tech over the over the last few years. Um, so we're considering uh, expansion of the merger control regime. So lastly, where are we in the process? Um, we published our report in, ju in July, as I said. Um, back in March, uh, the government commissioned the Digital Markets Task Force, which I'm helping to lead. Um, and we're doing it with Ofcom and the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, the ICO's input. Um, we are due to issue our formal advice to government next month. Um, and that will uh, deal with the practical application and design of the new regime. And, uh, and from there, we hope to proceed to legislation. So that's a very quick canter. Happy to discuss any of that in more detail. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Tom's running tight, so we'll see if we can crack on through a few questions. I just wanted to jump straight in on, on the one which uh, was raised pretty much by all, all, all panellists, which is who's in scope and who's out of scope. You know, on the one hand, you've got the UK SMS regime, which you, you, you stated. Oli was talking about who's in and who's out. Probably a general assumption that the gaffer uh, are in, but what's the next circle out? Will it be a, could it be a booking.com or indeed could it be someone, if you're in the UK trying to sell a house, there might be one or two platforms, which is the only place that you can sell your house online. So, uh, you know, but they might not come under your, under your UK revenue or under your threshold. So perhaps maybe I'll go to Michael first and then to Tom, just about how we define who's in scope and who's out. Michael. Well, I mean, you know, part of the problem, and that's where the fun bit about the uh, geopolitics uh, comes in, is that I think that the wagon is in front of the horses. So, you know, um, uh, having uh, partaken indirectly in some of the discussions in, in Europe, I think that, you know, there's a sense, certainly in some of the politicians driving it, that we know what the outcome is. And they're also bloody American. And now that the Brits are out, the French and the Germans are very happy to band together um, and would like to squash them. And that has created the momentum. And, you know, it, it's fun, you know, there's a uh, um, side in March was speaking about the garbage can model where a problem meets a solution uh, and the right conditions and they all come together. That's it. There is a real problem. There is a problem of competition. On the other hand, the political impetus has to do with geopolitics. Brexit also helped because part of the pragmatism of the Brits and the careful work of the CMA is, you know, politely seen, but not necessarily center stage. And I think that you do see a slightly stronger hand. Now, I do think that we have some important issues that relate to excessive power, but unfortunately, this is now a little bit mi uh, mingled. And I think that Putin.com may be inadvertently the one that's going to be sacrificed because we're certainly not going to sacrifice SAP because the Europeans would not like to have B2B in the firing line. And they said, no, we're going to have our own little kiddo, which is going to be called um, Gaia X. That's going to be the good, right, European proper way of doing things. So I think that it's a little hard to speak about that, totally extricating about the political realities that are bringing things to the fore. And the closer you are to some of the decision making, uh, perhaps I've been, you know, as an outsider, a little, a little too close for comfort. And I don't terribly care because I'm not part of this particular group. So here's the, <laughs> the more I think that you see part of that stuff. Now, I do think that it's a good opportunity, though, and I think that one of the things that's coming up, and uh, there will be uh, also much more discussion in the United States. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the ideas I was presenting on gatekeepers, I guess I'm going to be speaking about with the DOJ that's also starting to long and hard because they're like, we need to change our approach. There was a different report, which was from the House Judiciary Commission, which is not representative of what the DOJ does. So you have to understand all the things that are there. Let me wrap that up to simply say that there is a layers of complexity in what is really driving the decisions. I think that we are broadly moving into an area where the scope is going to be managed by some sense of, you know, it's the Judge Potter Stewart or whatever his name wants, uh, definition of um, pornography. I know it when I see it. What's a gatekeeper right now? The answer is I know it when I see it. I have not seen one paper doing it. I just finished writing one precisely because I have not seen one. Um, but I think that we need to think much more carefully about these types of issues. We will be thinking more carefully over the next few months. Right now, I think that there's going to be some effort to deal with the issue because we see a huge amount of tipping and we do see some excessive power. And by the way, we see some of the big tech throwing uh, some fairly cheap biscuits to the regulators to keep them quiet. Apple just said, oh, I'll cut my 
but my uh, my rates to 15%, not 30%. If you're really small and 1 million, then it's not going to cost me anything and it's going to be a good PR stunt. Google has done some sort of uh, internally naughty things that went to the press and the FT started gleefully noting it. So there's going to be exactly what you would expect in a uh, situation like this one. So there's going to be politics. There's going to be the pragmatism of what drives it. And I think that the answer is big tech and then a couple of others, because otherwise we can't really justify it. And then we are going to start a discussion, hopefully informed by people of this community. And that's where I agree with Ole, because we need to have a bit more of a truth criterion and you know some principles that underpin it, regardless of the hat that we have. Sorry, but that's too okay. difficult a question to answer quickly. No worries. Uh, no, not wishing to put Tom into the position of talking about politics or the B word and taking it down to more mundane prosaic levels uh, about the regulatory analysis. Would you just give you a chance to respond to that? Yeah, I've been at enough conferences over the last three years to know not to uh, start talking about Brexit, get into trouble very quickly. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I need to be slightly coy about exactly who will end up uh, being subject to it. Um, uh, certainly the GAFAM companies, uh, uh, obvious uh, companies to consider. Um, but we need to the whole regime will fall on its face if you do if you do the cart before the horse. Uh, you need to consider what problem are you trying to solve, um, and and who represents that problem, and then decide what to do about it. Because if you do it the other way around, it's, it's not going to work, is it? Um, and it's also you know, it's not a, it's not good enough to start talking about regulating Apple, regulating Google. Um, you need to think about exactly what within Google are you worried about, or what within Apple are you worried about. And so we're, uh, we're, uh, the way we're thinking of setting it up is where you consider it's not, uh, it's not just the, um, the, the regime as a whole will apply to the corporate group, but actually the, the detail, which is the important bit, uh, will apply to the designated activities that are found to have substantial and entrenched market power with a strategic position. Um, and that wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't expect, I mean, we haven't done it yet, but I, I wouldn't expect that would be everything Google does or everything Apple does or everything other than that. Um, it, it needs to be carefully and laid out in a very long and detailed document that everyone can read and see your reasoning. It's, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it needs to be evidence-led. Thanks. Ollie, what's your uh, response to that? You know, you're facing different flavors and attempts to regulate both cases and, and, and legislation based in Europe and then, and then Tom's approach. Uh, I mean, you know, look, I, I guess I, I, one reaction, I, I think that uh, just very quickly, I, uh, I have a lot of sympathy for, for the way Tom outlines things. We, we, you know, the, the process during the market study was extremely rigorous, right, which has led to where we are today, extremely rigorous. I, you know, I may disagree with, with bits and pieces of the final report, but I can't fault it on, you know, the, the desire and, and executing on uh, the kind of analysis that Tom's describing. That's very encouraging when you, look, when you, you know, engage with the regulators, they're prepared to take their time. They're, they're under a lot of pressure themselves, as we are but they are prepared to take the time and think creatively about how to gather the evidence, which ultimately allows us to isolate the issues. And we may disagree on the issues, but I want to find them as quickly as I can, and that's a shared interest. The one observation I would say on this is that I am struck by the speed with which some of the procedures in, in Europe are moving, the regulatory procedures. And that does, as an in-house lawyer, it does give you a, a, a sense of um, uh, trepidation, I think. The sort of political impetus to, to move and to deliver uh, regulatory reform how one squares that with the desire to be rigorous and thorough in the way that we first of all set up the tools for analysis, then conduct the, the analysis sensibly on an exped expedited basis, no doubt, but sensibly, and then come to the conclusions. Google, you ought to do this, you ought to stop doing that. So I do wonder, one observation, I do wonder how the to to two things can um, be squared because there's obviously a tension. Deliver, let's get this thing written uh, and let's do it right. Ole, I want you to answer your own question in that you raised, which was where do we draw the line between disruption and, and distortion? And you pose that for the other platforms listening in who might be trying to gain market share, trying to enter markets, trying to mix things up with a new with a new product. But some of the um, approach to the gaffer would, you know, such as the um, obligation to notify all of these mergers of very, very small things or not even be allowed to enter neighboring markets. Does it make you feel as though you're not allowed to disrupt anymore, that everything that you would do to expand or to, or in your eyes to innovate would be considered to be distorted? Um, that's a, that, that's a, a great, a big question. Look, I think that one of the things that is somewhat underestimated for when people think about how Google is operating 
is how closely um, we have followed, paid attention to, and continue to refer to big cases that we've been involved in. And the implications of those big cases, I think sometimes it's the, 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 the sense is, at least the, the sort of rhetoric around it, is it took, they take too long and nothing changes. Uh, they take a long time because they're complicated issues and because of various procedural events that happen along, along the course. Uh, there's a paper by two of our lawyers, Thomas Graf and Henry Moston, that talks about the history of some of the longer cases, if you're interested. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think as, as part of that, we learn a tremendous amount. Um, have those cases led to a, a chilling of innovation, de-launching, block launches? Things have certainly slowed down uh, when it comes to some of our uh, search verticals. We have to be much more mindful of the framework that's been given to us for assessment in the shopping case. That's a fact of life. Um, I think that the cases set out a, a, a rather clear um, uh, table of contents, if you like, the, the inputs that the regulator is going to be considering when they look at a particular search vertical. And so for that, they also speed us up a little bit. I know what to look for. Um, but I have to take the time to look for it and to discuss it internally. So that's really, you know, look, I don't think we're yet at a point where, where Google is, uh, you know, that we're seeing a, a raft of, of blocked launches, but certainly the regulatory reform that's on the horizon, if not done properly, does have the potential to do that. If vertical integrations are blocked per se, if you happen to be a gatekeeper, clearly that will lead to, I think, pro-competitive innovations being blocked. Um, so that's what we need to be careful is to make sure that you take the evidence-based framework, which is what the shopping decision is, and you try and work, figure out from that, well, what can I do to expedite that kind of analytical process? What evidence is important? What have we learned from those kinds of processes? Because I suspect that you could make things run a lot faster without jettisoning an evidence-based approach. And that's my, my hope, uh, optimistic hope for, for the new reform. I just put that thesis to that hope, vain or otherwise, to Tom, you know, um, which in response to this sort of, you know, set risk that not done properly, there could be a chilling effect. You know, you could put a halt on integration of things. If you go back 10 years, integration of maps into Google, you know, there's a court case about whether that would be nowadays would be anti-competitive, be seen as a, as, a, as a new product launch, pushing other people out the market. What's your response to that? Yeah, so um, uh, the BSM, the the, uh, the gatekeeper platforms entering into new markets um, was uh, is is a good thing. It's more it's more competition in the new market. Um, it's a matter of how that happens, and and in in the short term, uh, the short term versus the long term, um, you may uh, you may get an efficiency and a consumer benefit in the short term. Um, from something uh, from uh, from the large platform moving into a new market, uh, but in the long term, when if you look five years later, there's no one else competing because they've been pushed out from because of the unfair advantages and and whatever uh, whatever has happened um, on behalf of the platform. Then, then you could expect innovation to drop because uh, it's an unassailable market position that uh, that the platform has got. So so so. It's really difficult, and uh, if we do intervene badly, uh, you could dampen innovation. Um, we haven't yet drafted the code of the codes of conduct. Well, we haven't yet designated people that would be subject to the code of conduct. Um, so there's a way to go before we actually get there. Um, and uh, but we'll certainly. I think that's why you need a principles-based um, regulation where where you can get into the weeds and discuss these complex trade-offs and and uh, and you need to make your case if you're going to intervene thanks um our time is up but i'm going to give the last 30 seconds to michael to respond to that and then we will hand it back to the um well, I agree on the need to have um, uh, principles based. I would say uh, to complement what Oli is uh, saying that we need not only evidence based, but we need you know to articulate the logic. Some of the things we will not need to have lengthy uh, procedures to find out whether that something is wrong or not. We may decide some practices for reasons that still are being discussed are simply not good or even if we think that should be allowed, it's this gray list idea that you can go ahead and do that, but you have to show us why this is not a thing about it. I think that that is a reasonable uh, set of practices, one of the best things that is coming out from the current DC, uh, uh, DSA and NCT discussions in the European Union, and I hope will essentially change the burden of proof. Second and related to that, and that relates to this community, I think that what I have been surprised at how lacking it is, is the input of people who make other smaller platforms. Now, for my sense, having worked for a number of years with uh, uh, people who 
who are interested in building their own ecosystems are now have a quasi-regulatory role as a chief uh, digital advisor in one of the NRAs. And um, it's been surprising that I don't hear much of the evidence of the people who are the smaller platforms, which we would like to encourage to say, well, what are the problems that you actually have or what would make it more competitive in uh, your uh, in your view, and perhaps the uh, 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 the CMA has had much more of that, but I haven't seen it in any systematic way. And I think that it'd be great to engage people from this community uh, in order to have a more responsive policy. We cannot have the national regulatory agencies or the European one or the American one be the sole bottleneck. They can be the facilitators, but in a way we have to rethink the whole ecosystem, having a greater participation of the people who are in the cold face of trying to build these platforms and who see what is fair and unfair that will connect much better to the regulators. So this is the hope and that's the role that I think this community has to play. Thank you very much, Michael. I just quickly thank uh, Tom and Ollie as well for their, um, their input and the fruitful discussion. And we are a few minutes over, but we started a few minutes late. So uh, thank you. And I'll hand back to Petra. Thank you very much, uh, Lewis, Michael, Ollie, and Tom. Um, fascinating, uh, again, like the first panel, um, and definitely felt the passion about the topic uh, that uh, uh, you guys displayed. Um, as per our agenda, we should have a 10 minutes break, but we want to be respectful of your time and um, don't want to overrun too much. So we're proposing to cut this short to five minutes. Um, it's enough time to stretch your legs, um, chop up your coffees or teas or perhaps a glass of wine, depending on where you are joining us from. Um, and also really a little teaser, don't go too far. Uh, Louise uh, Plantin, our illustrator, has created um, a few little videos showcasing the development of her fantastic creative work. And we're going to show this during the break. Um, so without any further me stealing of your time, um, chop up your, your drinks, uh, stretch your legs, and we'll see you back in five minutes time. Thank you. excited for our third panel and um, welcome back. Um, so after platform impact and platform regulation, we are now going to do a deep dive into platform governance, the third pillar of um, our focus of today. I'm going to introduce our panel. Um, which is going to focus um, because, as Law said at the beginning, unlike traditional business platforms, um, orchestrate complex ecosystem and co-create value with their participants. And our um, our uh, governance panel is going to explore the principles, um, the governance principles of platform, the challenges associated with an ecosystem management, and the importance of trust in particular. Moderator for our final panel is Azim Azar, an, an award-winning entrepreneur, analyst, strategist, and investor. You will likely know him as the face and voice behind Exponential Review, the leading newsletter and HBR podcast on the impact of technology on our future economy and society. Azim, over to you and your panel. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, uh, 
Petra. So our discussion is uh, going to cover off questions of platform governance, and I think we should get straight in uh, to each of your opening statements. And perhaps uh, I'll tell the audience who we have with us first. So we have Frederick Mazella, the founder and president of, you know, one of the true car sharing uh, platforms in the world, Blah Blah Car, a, now a, a unicorn, a community of more than 100 million members. We have Rob Chestnut, who was until recently the chief ethics officer of Airbnb. Rob has just published a book, Institutional Integrity, uh, which is on how smart companies can lead an ethical revolution. And of course, we have Sasha Michaud, who is the co-founder of Glovo, which is an incredibly fast growing on demand uh, service. Uh, so we are going to uh, kick off with uh, Frederic. Frederic, please, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I have some. Um, I wanted to talk about the the way we we build trust in a, in our community. I have some slides. I'll try to uh, show them, or maybe Petra, you can help with that and and diffuse the, the slides if you have them. Okay, so let's begin with the the, the first ones. It's very simple slides. It's just to give uh, an illustration of what we do. So today, uh, as you said, Azim, um, blah blah car is a is a real um, sharing platform because we have drivers and passengers who are going the same way, who are sharing their rights. So we do pure carpooling um, and it's people like you and me who share their cars uh, everywhere they, they can go. Uh, and um, it's in the 22 countries uh, now. Uh, what we have done over the years is, and maybe we can go to the next slide, um, is uh, to, um, to build trust because uh, frankly, the thing is uh, people have to trust each other to travel together. And this has been a key component in, uh, in the way we've been able to deploy the community. Um, so it's been uh, articulated through a model that we created, which is called the DREAMS model, um, which we can uh, just see on the, on the next slide. It's based on six pillars. Um, so DREAMS uh, stands for uh, D for declared, R for rated, E for engaged, A for active, N for moderated, and S for social. It's um, the six pillars of trust that you are able to build in an online community uh, using online tools, I would say digital tools. So uh, the information you have to have access to in order to build your trust towards someone you've never met is, um, uh, can, be, can be seen uh, along these six pillars because some information will be declared. So it's like your first name or your picture or your, uh, what you do uh, for a living, if you're a teacher, if you like music, it's well, all those things uh, and your age and everything. So the things that you declare, then the information which is rated. So that will be, uh, of course, the ratings that people leave to each other, which really help uh, in building the trust. Engage is when you, for example, do a booking. So like you book, you pay online and this engages you uh, to, in the transactions. Um, and then active is the, the kind of information you see, for example, someone registered uh, like uh, three years ago and he was connected two hours ago or he's live right now or this kind of information or he published uh, like, uh, I don't know, 179 trips already. And you see the activity. This also creates more trust uh, towards the person. The M is for moderated. So it's everything we do uh, at the platform to moderate the exchanges. And the S is for social because people can link their blah, blah, car profile with some other uh, social networks like uh, Facebook or LinkedIn. And this also creates some more trust. Then what we were really interested in was to see if it really had an impact. So we tried to measure the level of trust we were able to build thanks to uh, this model. Um, and so we can go to the next slide. We've got some amazing results. We had conducted this study a few years ago. And um, actually we asked people to rank on a scale from zero to five, the level of trust they had in several types of people. So uh, from social media contact to family members. And we considered um, a rating of four or five out of five to be a very high trust. Uh, and this has conducted us to, to see that actually uh, on this scale, we had blah, blah, car on the podium uh, number three, right after the family members and the friends, um, because actually you know a lot of things about the people you'll be traveling with. And this has been uh, very instrumental in, in um, 
making people go on and on and, and carpool together. Uh, you can see that the level of trust we're able to achieve thanks to this model and all the information we share with, uh, um, with our members is a lot higher than the level of trust you have between neighbors or between colleagues. Uh, neighbors are 42% and colleagues are 58%. So again, the percentage we give is the percentage of people who gave a rating of four or five out of five uh, in terms of uh, trust. So to, for us, it was uh, kind of the proof. So this study has been done on 18,000 respondents in 11 countries. So it's really a kind of a, a bulletproof data and with a, a, lot of, uh, um, a lot of participants. And so um, then this is um, about the, the theory that uh, I wanted to share with you because it's been the way we've articulated uh, this, which has made the success of uh, the, the growing community of Blah Blah Car from, uh, so from uh, European countries to also in Russia, Brazil, and everywhere we are uh, on the planet. And so um, it's been summarized as well in a study we published with uh, Arun Sundararajan, whom you, who you whom you've seen in a previous uh, conference, I think, um, and who's a specialist on trust. And we had worked on this study together. The study is called Entering the Trust Age. You can find it on the net. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, other information in it, which uh, you may find useful if you have to um, create or deploy your platform and create trust between people. This is a way of doing the governance. I had a last slide, but I think it was just about this. Um, I, it was about the blah blah brand effect as well. We were um, curious to see how much trust was generated by the Dreams model itself and how much trust was generated by our brand itself. So we asked people, how much trust do you, would you have uh, uh, if you had access to the exact same information you have on BlaBlaCar, but it would be a generic platform. It would be a platform which doesn't hold the brand BlaBlaCar. We wanted to see if there was some kind of a brand effect from our um, brand itself and not only from the model, the, the Dreams model itself. And actually there is a brand effect which we have uh, measured to be uh, of 21%. Uh, between the, the, like, uh, um, the trust people would have uh, on profiles diffused on the generic platform and uh, in profiles diffused on the, the, the exact same profiles but diffused with the blah, blah car brand next to it. And so this also proves that uh, it's always worth uh, investing in your, in your brand. Um, and then the last thing was about a link to uh, the last slide was a, a link on the, the entering the trust stage study we conducted with um, NYU Stern professor uh, Arun Sundararajan as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you, uh, Frederic. Uh, there's a lot to think about in your trust framework, a lot to, to dream about, dare I say it. Uh, uh, what I'd like to do is turn over to uh, Rob, who I, I guess it's, uh, it's the morning for you, Rob, and for, uh, to hear your opening statement, please. Thanks, and I'll, I'll follow uh, uh, Frederick and talk about trust a little bit uh, as well, because I think uh, if you are operating a platform, you are in the trust business. You don't have a, a product yourself. You're in the business of helping people trust each other on your platform. And I, I think one thing we've seen, you know, I, I've been involved in platforms ever since the early days of eBay. And it's been really interesting to watch uh, what's happening with trust and the, the obligations of platforms during that period. You know, I, there's a, a study called the Edelman Trust Survey. It uh, does a global view of trust around the world. It shows right now that trust is at an all-time low uh, across uh, all elements. Uh, trust in government is at an all-time low. Trust in the media trust in uh, corporations. And so one of the aspects of their study is if you wanna build trust, uh, trust is made up of two things. It's made up of competence and integrity. And you know, of those two factors, integrity is actually the, uh, the more important. It's actually three times as powerful as competence. So um, if you wanna build trust in a platform, uh, one thing you've got to be looking at is, you know, how are people looking at your brand, the integrity of what you do and the way that you operate? Uh, in the old days, uh, for example, at eBay, I think uh, executives tended to shy away from controversial subjects. Uh, platforms tended to be very hands-off. 
you know, uh, the, the famous phrase, we're only a platform, was something you heard over and over again. Uh, I think those days are past. Uh, I think people now are looking for platforms to become leaders in integrity. And in fact, I think they're looking at companies as a whole to be leaders in solving some of the world's greatest problems. I think some of this is a reflection of the fact that many of us have lost confidence in government's ability or willingness to address some of the world's biggest issues. And we're increasingly looking to companies to do it. Uh, and I think uh, we've seen the charge being led by a couple of different groups. One's been employees. And you know, we talk about the pressure that government puts on companies and platforms. Uh, a lot of pressure has actually come from inside the companies themselves. You know, we've seen, uh, you know, in the old days, I think employees, if they saw their company not operating with integrity, uh, they'd sit on their hands. Uh, not anymore. I mean, we are in an age now where employees are empowered as never before. They're mobile. Uh, and if they, they want to go to work every day, not just to make a paycheck. Uh, they want to feel like they're changing the world. They want to feel like they are doing good in the world. And if they see something they don't like inside of their own company, uh, they're talking to each other on blind and on Slack. They are uh, blogging about it. They're tweeting about it. Uh, they're walking out. They're organizing walkouts now. So, you know, in, in one sense, I think companies are feeling the heat from inside uh, to operate with integrity. And they're also feeling it from consumers. You know, we are in an age of conscious consumerism. Data shows that uh, like never before, consumers are now considering the view, their view of the integrity purpose of the company that they're doing business with. And if they see a company whose values are aligned, uh, they will become passionate consumers, uh, defenders of the brand. Uh, on the other hand, if they see a company whose values are not aligned with their own values, they're taking their money and they're moving it somewhere else. So I, look, I, I think it's a tough time to be a leader in that uh, the world's eyes are watching you. You are now expected to do more than just make money. Uh, you know, making money is uh, critical. Uh, and, and uh, companies need it in order to survive. But we are gradually abandoning this notion that uh, leaders need to focus on shareholder value and shareholder value alone. Uh, shareholder value is a concept uh, and something I think that has led a lot of companies for decades to focus on hitting a quarterly number, hit that stock price, uh, get that stock price up. And if it Hits the, if the stock goes up, then it's good. And if it doesn't cause the stock to go up this quarter, then it's bad. Uh, that's created a lot of short-term thinking. And I frankly think that's caused a lot of companies to cut some ethical corners. Uh, and we are now recognizing as a world that we need more from companies. We need companies to step up and solve some of the world's biggest problems. And that may mean that they may need to start considering things like how much carbon they're dumping into the air. Uh, where are they getting their supplies on the other side of the world? And what are the working conditions there? Uh, how do you treat your customers? How do you treat your employees? Uh, in this new age of leadership, I think that companies need to have a North Star. They need to have a purpose. And that purpose uh, isn't profit. Profit is not a purpose. You've got to have a reason why what you're doing is good for the world. Um, and you need to be able to communicate it. You need to be able to, uh, I, I think, articulate it. And in this new world, I think if you can articulate that purpose and inspire others, uh, uh, you can come out ahead. And in fact, uh, integrity can be wind at your back. Uh, on the other hand, I think a failure to do it can, can put you uh, behind in this curve. Yeah, somebody just mentioned uh, in the notes that eBay used to uh, chase the stock price quarter by quarter. And I think, unfortunately, there's an element of truth to that. Amazon didn't. And Amazon, that was one of the reasons I think Amazon got ahead, because they, they set out a, a very clear message that they were going to operate for the long term. I think eBay, uh, you're, you're seeing uh, uh, changes at eBay, but look at Airbnb. Uh, Airbnb just announced that they're filing to go public. And I think you'll see in their filings a clear desire to operate for the long term not to chase a quarterly number. 
Uh, you see this, for example, in discrimination, how they handled discrimination on their platform. You know, a, a few years back, if you recall, Airbnb was racked with claims that users were being discriminated against. And you know, Airbnb's response to it was not, we're only a platform. I remember Brian looked at me and said, Rob, if this is happening on our platform, we are failing as a company. Don't care what it costs, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to fix it. And he did. Um, and I, I think it's that kind of purpose-driven leadership that uh, will inspire integrity uh, and inspire confidence and ultimately build trust in platforms. Uh, thank you, Rob. That was a very powerful statement. And on the point of, uh, of Airbnb uh, and its, its integrity, I think you, you, the, the firm had to get rid of 1.4 million uh, hosts who didn't sign up to your anti-bigotry clause, which was yeah. which sellers who you're saying, please go away. We lost 1.1% uh, of our users when we ask everyone to take a simple pledge that they wouldn't discriminate based on the color of someone's skin or their, their race or nationality. And I think Airbnb's response to that was, uh, you know what, in the long run, we're going to be better off standing for something in that kind of circumstance than chasing the number. So. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that statement. I think we just have um, uh, Sasha now left to go to, to do your introductory remarks. And if you can just keep them to, to five minutes, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, I'll go as quick as possible. I think we're running late. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Um, just, I'll give a quick intro to Global for those of us who don't know us. Um, we're, we're, we're not a multi-category on-demand platform. We are founded in Barcelona in 2015. We have about 1,500 employees worldwide. We're in 22 countries, around 600 cities operating. And we have about 45,000 um, partners, partners as local stores or restaurants on the platform. And we have over 50,000 active lovers. There are careers, on-demand careers who work um, on an active basis. And our vision is to give easy access to anything in your city. Um, I think it's fair to say that, you know, entrepreneurs are generally um, naive optimists. Um, I think that's good, because if you really were not like that, you probably would never start your business. Um, and the reality is, you know, with, with Global's case, you know, we, when we started this and I thought, well, you know, wouldn't it be great that people just order anything in their city through their smartphone and, and we'd, you know, go to these local stores and restaurants and give them incremental revenue. And then we'd have all these, all these couriers who, you know, in their free time could actually, you know, earn some extra hours and et cetera. And, and the reality is, is often very different from that. I mean, you wake up a few years later when you're having a massive socioeconomic impact in the cities where you work. Um, you find out you're in the massive debate of the future of work um, and you say, what's going on here? We just had a, a cool idea and we thought we, it was great for everyone. And, um, and the reality is, is that it's often very different for the profile of our, of our careers. I mean, most of them are not just looking for a couple of hours a day extra work. Um, we're often a financial life, lifeline for their families. Uh, I'm not saying they didn't necessarily all dedicate full time to the job, but it's, it's certainly they're here for the economic impact. And so we need to take that into consideration. And then the next piece is obviously regulatory relationship towards that is the same, no? Um, that it needs to be, th these workers are, are in need of income and they need to be protected. And, um, and then the importance to our partners, um, you know, what I mentioned earlier, I mean, you know, we, we consider it would be a nice incremental income to their core business. And at the end of the day, I mean, COVID is a good example of that, of how we've become a lifeline for them. You know, 90% of Global's partners are actually SMEs. Uh, and these guys have been the hardest hit by COVID. So, so they're actually really relying on platform and, and companies like Global to actually survive. You know? So it's suddenly become super important in, in the cities where we go. And, and you know, with size comes responsibility. Just looking at the bigger picture, I think, you know, going back to our partners, um, you know, I think there's, there's a massive opportunity now um, as consumer habits, I think, have changed. They've been accelerated with COVID. Um, I think, you know, wanting things immediately now is in, a set, in essence, um, instead of 24, 48 hours. The great thing, the retailers who've generally been the last to really adapt to this digital revolution we're, we're living, um, have probably been the last to go into this. And I think they have a unique opportunity because they're the closest their product is to the consumer. Um, you know, the great e-commerce giants generally have the product thousands and thousands of kilometers away from the consumer, and it's never going to get them 30 minutes, whereas the retailers can actually suddenly can convert themselves into virtual warehouses. And I think they need to move quickly because the giants are not going to wait around. They're already moving into the city. They're already bringing the products close to the cities. Um, and, you know, our position is we're an ally to them. Um, going back to a little bit to, to governance and regulation, you know, I think as well, and, and certainly we're to blame from that, the 
you know, digital companies and platforms, we, we often say, you know, flexibility, um, give people what they want, give the workers what they want. But the reality is there's, there's different necessities in different regions. Um, Global is in four, four continents. The reality is in, you know, in, in, in Ivory Coast compared to, to Barcelona, compared to Kiev, to, to compared to Buenos Aires are very different. Um, you know, um, where in the Southern Europe, you know, social protection and rights are fundamental for workers. And I think in the whole of EU, and I think it's something that I think generally most of us agree with. In, in Ivory Coast or, or Latin America, it's more important that actually most people are paid in cash. So we're actually fixing that. So we're actually seen by governments as a great tool to actually um, give transparency um, to something which is a submerged economy. Um, so to be very, very quick, I think, you know, from my perspective, I think we need to, you know, it's, we believe that it's, we do need regulation, um, specifically in our sector. Um, however, what, for regulators and policymakers to do correct regulation, they need to be better informed. Something that with my discussions with policymakers, they're very ill-informed or, or little informed about how our, our approach works, who, who the people are on the platform. Um, and I think that's something across pretty much all, all the reasons, it's not something specific to one, one country. And then going back to, I think just on the trust mentioned, I think it's a great word. Um, I think we're to blame um, the platforms of not being transparent enough. Transparent builds trust, but not just with the consumer. I think it builds it with the regulators. Um, and I think we need to change the conversation. And I think that I hope that was quick enough. Thank you so much, uh, Sasha. And you you drew attention uh, there to I think one of the key dimensions of, of the question of governance. You know what what is what is governance uh, of any uh, uh, organization, institution, or platform? It's about managing the conflicts that might arise between different participants uh, on a uh, on a platform. Um, and how you go about thinking about those, those conflicts, which might include the value sharing, right? Who gets which piece of the pie? I thought what was quite interesting in your articulation was that you also identified that between the SMEs on the one side and the riders on the other, there were non-platform participants whose considerations uh, come, to, come to mind. In your case, you were talking about the government authorities in, in Ivory Coast who have different uh, needs, but you were trying to attend to those 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 needs um, than those local requirements. And, and I guess in the case of, of Airbnb, um, you know some of the non uh, the non participant stakeholders you had to deal with would have been uh, city authorities uh, in different parts of the world. But I'm curious with these three experts in front of us, which is how do they think about this? The question of what does it mean for a platform to exhibit good Governance. I mean, what do, what is good governance in the context of a of a of a platform? And perhaps, um, Frederick, since you've had the the longest time to catch your breath, you'd like to give us maybe a short a short response, and we can we can check in with the others. In terms of governance, what you need to be uh, very careful about. So some some components were mentioned, which were like a transparency. So transparency is very important, but also I think that the rules themselves need to be very clear and simple and that you need to make sure the entire community is aware of them. Um, and I think once you've done that, you've gone a long way, actually. Um, if your rules are too complex, then it creates uh, suspicion, it creates um, uh, fear. Uh, so it does not really help you in, um, in administrating the community. Uh, but uh, and so making very clear rules is always more complicated than we think. It's just like uh, making a synthesis. It's it, it takes longer than just writing a text. Uh, and so if you want to make a good synthesis, and you need to spend a lot of time uh, thinking about the, the the exact words you would be using. And I, I would tend to think that it's the same for the rules. Um, it takes time to create very very simple and fair rules. Once you've done that, you are able to diffuse them in the community, make sure everybody understand them. And once you've done that, uh, you're on the way to uh, having a governance which is uh, transparent and understood by everybody. That's, that's really helpful. This idea that if the rules are transparent, people know what they're signing up to and they can decide to sign up to or, or not uh, is a sort of a pow powerful idea. Rob, how do you think about uh, what it means for a platform to have good governance? I, I think it starts with identifying your stakeholders. Uh, you know, if, if once you accept the principle that it's not just all about making money, 
who are you operating for? And what are the metrics? You know, look, I think companies naturally do what they measure. And, you know, everybody's really good at measuring the financials. We, you know, everybody knows how much money they're making, what their profits numbers are, and what their expenses are. But I think it like taking Airbnb again as an example, Airbnb's got five stakeholders. Everybody in the company knows who they are. You know, it's uh, their, their investors, the guest, the host, the employees, and also the community at large. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that you're going to see a lot more over the next five to 10 years is companies are going to get a lot better at specifically identifying who their stakeholders are. And what are the metrics that they use to measure the health of those stakeholders? And I think when you are operating for stakeholders as opposed to simply shareholders, uh, I think you, you start to think about things like, you know, what you, whether what you're doing is good for the community at large. And when you do that, the, gov the governments may feel less of a need to govern you. If once you start recognizing that you've got that obligation, you can start to build trust with a bigger community, uh, and I think stave off some regulation that might be harmful. Can, can I pick, pick you up on, on one thought there? So of course, Sasha is from Barcelona and Airbnb had an interesting time in Barcelona. One of the uh, stakeholders you didn't raise, you talked the community at large, but I, I didn't hear whether that applied to the specific cities or municipalities in which you had concentrations of people. So looking back at what happened in Barcelona and some other cities, what did you learn about what, what Airbnb did right from the governance of those external stakeholders? And how would you do it differently uh, now that we've been through some of the frictions and we've, we've come through an agreement, got to an agreement? I think working through that world of what's good for the community, uh, it can be messy, particularly in the earlier days, right? So I think a lot of the challenges that Airbnb had working with communities, the important thing was that Airbnb recognized that it had an obligation to those communities, right? Airbnb never took the view that, well, that's not our problem. Uh, you know, we're, we're here to make money. And as long as it's legal, we're going to go forward. I don't think that was ever Airbnb's approach. I think their approach was, if we're not good for a community, we need to figure out why. And we need to figure out what's the best path forward. Now, what you were often dealing with in these situations were, you know, the entrenched uh, organizations, the hotels, who naturally don't want you. So they're going to put up a very aggressive effort, both politically and in a marketing perspective, to, to advance the narrative that you're bad for the community. Mm. So uh, what you've got to do is you've got to work through with the communities, often battling with entrenched interest in order to get it to a good place. And I think, you know, ultimately Airbnb has gotten to a good place with a lot of communities around the, around the world. Look, Airbnb collects, voluntarily collects tax money mm -hmm. to support the communities and has collected billions in taxes. And I think they've also worked through reasonable regulations with localities, you know, to, that I think recognize that Airbnb brings a lot of good to communities, does a lot of great things for people in the communities. And if unchecked and completely unregulated could cause harm, and that's why Airbnb, I think, has worked and agreed to a number of those regulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sasha. I, I got into the Rob's follow up there, but I'd like to bring the original question back to you, which is what does it for, for you? What does it mean for a platform to exhibit good governance? Um, I'll, I'll try not to repeat what my co-panelists said. I think they're bang on. Um, I think, you know, for, for me, it's often be auto regulating yourselves. Um, we're often ahead of the curve um, with regulation. And I think um, you know, one of the best ways is to auto regulate yourself. And, and, and I'll give you some examples in, my, in our case, which is quite simple, you know, it's, and, and I think um, Bob meant, um, mentioned it about um, understanding your stakeholders is key, knowing them and then, but really understanding what makes them tick. And, and, and that also becomes good business because if you do things for them then they'll come back, a good example would be our partners, for example, you know, really understand their margins, their business margins and how that works. We'll identify what you know, the, how far we can go with our commissions, and how far we can work together. Um, the same with our, the same with our couriers, and and obviously the same with everything in our ecosystem um, around that. And then also the impact we're having in our cities, in our case, because we're very similar to Airbnb, and then we're a city company and, and have massive impact. So I really think auto regulating ourselves, mm. and and I mentioned it before, but also being transparent about that as much as you can without giving away trade secrets. 
put you in a position because otherwise they're going to regulate you and and generally strict regulation is not good for anyone it's certainly not good for the stakeholders who end up their, their incomes limited or the opportunities of work is limited and um, our growth and our potential social economic impact in the cities is limited so so either we, we, we do it ourselves and we're transparent about it or we get hit in the head. And, and, and unfortunately, I think, you know, tech companies have probably been a little bit guilty of not seeing that coming. Not all companies, there's some, some great examples, but I think generally, you know, tech, tech was going to fix everything 15 years ago. We we're going to save the world. And now look at, I mean, you know, we're the enemy number one and, and we've got to be realistic that we, we, we have a great opportunity. And I think ethics and auto regulation are, are the key. I, I, so I'm going to come back with a follow up for you and then we'll send it back around your other panelists. So. I, I'm curious about the uh, the leader, the, the 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 balance the leader has to strike. So I remember when Airbnb uh, rolled out in in the UK, and we had um, nine flats and house bites um, running around as well, and there was a market share chase. And the perspective from the product managers uh, is also about how do I deliver to my, my consumer, my seller? How do I deliver on the buyer side? How do I eliminate friction? And one of the things that strikes me is that at those moments, perhaps you don't have the mental space to think about the impact on the, the, the sort of second or third order stakeholder who isn't on the dashboard. Um, and, and I guess, Sasha, your firm is, is the youngest of the three here and is, 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 in, that, is in that trigger. Um, how I'll lay out kind of a couple of considerations and answer how you how you like in a sense. How do you think about the um, the, the competences and the skill sets that you need in the the teams that land in local markets and they have to gr grow out? Um, or, or and perhaps another way of asking that question is: Do you actually have that conversation which says perhaps we should grow slower in city X because we are pushing up against you know, other non, not non platform participants, and it could cause an issue. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to answer that and that we were super strategic and, and everything. To be honest, I mean, we're a five year old company, we've grown incredibly quickly. And most of the time, it's really learning as you go, um, which might not be great, you know, to regulators um, ears, because with the size of the company, then, you know, you should, we should be more responsible. But at the end of the day, you're competing against companies in our case, much bigger than ourselves. In, in pretty much every, every. so um, I think it's got a lot to do with this auto, auto governance internally that we have. And, you know, I mean, we, we've, we have an ethics committee, um, but we've had one for a long time. And this is very unusual for a, for a startup, our size and our age. Um, and that, that comes more into play. We've probably, I can be honest, we've never had the decision to say slow down in that city, I'll, I'll be fair. But the, but the launching team and the, and, and the management team that we, we put into the country, there's a clear, there's a clear, uh, there's a clear trait on 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 that person, and, and there's a key part of that, which is which is ethics and doing things right and looking after the ecosystem. Um, that that you know, and that that goes back to what Rob said earlier about stakeholders and really knowing them well and what's important to them. Mm. Uh, Frederick, maybe we could bring you in on this uh, this discussion, which is around um, how you think about either the competencies or the skill sets that you need to bundle. Um, or whether, you, whether you've actually had moments where you've exhibited auto-regulation, as Sasha terms it, in, in Blah Blah Blah's recent history. Yeah, well, the, the, the main thing is um, in order to auto-regulate uh, yourself, it is good that you actually experience the product yourself as well. We've got, you know, um, a principle at Blah Blah Car, which is called uh, Be the Member. Initially, it was a principle which we called uh, Think It, Build It, Use It. Uh, which um, was kind of a philosophy of not only being the builders of the platform, but really also be the members that we were uh, building the service for. And um, when you say build it, uh, well, think it, build it, use it, you actually have several roles which allow you to see your service from different angles. And it really helps you in auto-regulating yourself and making the rules as fair and as understandable as possible and make also the best product you can. So um, it is a method for uh, really achieving the fact that you're not um, just building a service for others, but also for yourself. And you be, be, sooner or later, you become to be the, uh, the most demanding customer 
for your service. And when you are the most demanding customer, then you're usually uh, on a good path to uh, making the rules as fair as possible. Uh, Rob, you've got a lot of experience in, um, uh, in this. You've just put this all down in a book. So I, I want to maybe ask you a slightly different question, um, which is, do you, um, uh, you know, Sasha talked about an, an ethics committee that is a, a, a sort of, that exists now. How do you recommend from a governance uh, perspective that these um, aspects, which may be non-financial, right? They may be slightly harder to measure, be um, uh, sort of executed within, within the organization. Is it centers of excellence? Uh, is it training down the line? What is the, the right uh, approach? Yeah, there, there's not one answer. You know, it's a number of things. It, it, it has to start at the top. Because you know, look, if the board is not bought into what you're measuring and who your stakeholders are and what your goals are, then you're going to get nowhere. Uh, so I think it has to start with aligning the you know the board, the CEO, uh, and and ensuring that everybody's on the same page about what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, then I think leaders have to be willing to talk about it. Uh, you know, too often like integrity and ethics are are, are unspoken. Uh, they're, they're a poster on the wall or they're, they're buried in a code of conduct three links deep in your internet. Uh, I, I think if you really want to operate a company with integrity, leaders have to be willing to uh, speak it, talk about it, and inspire people inside the company and make sure it's really clear to everybody that's the way that we're going to operate here. Mm. Um, once you do that, though, look, I, at Airbnb, we had ethics ambassadors. We had people that were engineers. They were in marketing, they were in sales, they were in customer support. These are people that you know we depended on to get input on what are the ethical issues that you're facing inside of your group um, and get their input to get the right answer. Because look, when it comes to integrity, uh, there isn't always one clear answer. It can get kind of gray. And if you want to get it right, you got to be willing to listen to people with different life experiences and backgrounds. Uh, thank you. Now, we've got a, a minute or two left on this, uh, this panel, unless I get told um, otherwise from, from Petra. Um, uh, one question I wanted to put out on, on, on the issue of governance and governance across organizations is that normally, um, just to quote uh, the sort of um, founding fathers, you know, no, no taxation without representation. Um, normally, uh, in, in, in environments where there is governance at play, stakeholders have some mechanism to um, e express themselves. Uh, what are the sorts of tools you think platforms should use um, in order to understand what kind of governance friction is emerging? Uh, because clearly you're not, you, you know, you're not gonna run a parliament with everybody. Um, and are there, are there specific techniques that you think are particularly relevant for platforms to understand those sorts of issues? And perhaps um, we can start with Sasha, go to Frederick and then uh, end with, with Rob. And we've only got a minute, so sort of quick answers to this one. Okay, so, so, in, so in our case, I think the, the main thing what we've done and I think has generally been relatively successful, not, not, not always, is, is reaching out very early on when we go to a specific country or region, um, meeting stakeholders, above all regional stakeholders, um, policymakers, and letting them understand our business from day one um there, there are issues they they will counter and they want to know more about it but i think that that is very important um and and we and also be very transparent with information about our company data um how our algorithms work um who, who are the profile um rob mentioned it again you know who are the profile of, of the stakeholders on our platform mm -hmm. i think that's been the tool that's been most useful for us um and and so far i mean generally it's 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 working quite well wonderful thank you frederick well it, i'll just try to 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 say one thing which uh, has been working well for us it's making sure you've got a strong link between your customer support and your product team um and that they are not separate and that they talk a lot um, because usually your customer support is trying to fix quickly the problem that your members or your clients have with what they have. But they, if they don't have a voice um, to the product and tech team, 
then they stay in that state and they don't uh, help the product to get improved for uh, on, on the long term. Sometimes improving the product may take like uh, six or 12 or 18 months. But um, if, you, if you consider that customer support is dealing um, short term with the issues of the customers and product is dealing long term, but you don't have a bridge in between them, then um, you can't really have a, a, a strong governance, I think. So the, the main point is you can have a team which is a, a customer voice or a member voice, which is a bridge between customer support and product. Thank you. Rob, final word to you. Oh, they, both of their points were so good. I'm just going to put them into two words that I think leaders need. Uh, humility uh, and curiosity. So uh, I think you need to, if you approach these sorts of issues where you're constantly listening and, and with, with real curiosity about how others are experiencing your product and with a humility, uh, with an openness to the fact that you may not have absolutely gotten it right and you may need to, to change course. Uh, I think you'll survive better in this environment. Well, with that, uh, thank you to our panelists, uh, Rob Chestnut and uh, Frederick Mazella and Sasha Michaud. I will be handing over, I believe, to Benoit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nearly to Benoit. <laughs> One more time for me. Thank you so, so much, Azim, Fred, Rob, and Sasha. I know I'm repeating myself, fascinating. And again, we could have continued much, much longer. Um, I hope that we can have a repeat or follow on session in the not too distant future. Uh, for, for us, it's really important um, that we also stick to the timelines. Uh, it's either coming to the end of your working day or it is at the very beginning of your working day. So the rather difficult task now lies with Benoit to give us a wrap um, of this uh, session. Uh, Benoit is the co-founder and managing director of Launchworks and Co. And he is the other co-author of the platform strategy book and also the co-chair of this event. And I'm happy that I didn't twist my tongue with all the co's here. Benoit, over to you for the closing remarks today. Thank you very much, uh, Petra. Uh, fascinating panel, as you, as you said, a fascinating afternoon, really. And uh, as Laura said at the outset, I mean, that, that's what Platform Leaders is all about, uh, you know, bringing together uh, thought leaders, academics, practitioners, policymakers to debate, uh, to discuss uh, the future of digital platforms. And collectively, uh, we, can, uh, we can contribute to actually unlocking the, the full potential uh, of these innovative business models for all. Now, summarizing uh, all that was said today in a few minutes is a, is a very difficult uh, exercise, uh, probably impossible, and I'm, I'm not sure I can uh, do justice to all the insights uh, of our uh, panelists uh, and moderators, but I'll just share with you some, uh, some of the salient points, I think, that uh, I took away from, uh, from these panels. I'll start with, with the last panel, uh, the governance panel. Uh, which was very interesting because when you talk about governance, often people think about, oh, this is uh, some obscure discussion at board level about what is allowed and what is not allowed. And, and that's uh, part of it and that's important. But in the context of platforms, when you talk about um, governance, you talk about ecosystem level governance, you talk about uh, how you manage the ecosystem, uh, you talk about you know, the, the stakeholders uh, with whom you co-create uh, the value and the rules and norms and laws that you need to put in place uh, for that to work uh, in, in, in balance. So trust, and, and all our panelists talked about trust, trust is absolutely fundamental. And when we, when we work with, with traditional firms um, or we advise uh, you know, new platforms, uh, trust is not the, the, uh, the initial reflex, but it, it, it's critical. And, and Fred reminded us about the trust architecture, the, the dreams framework that he has developed uh, for BlaBlaCar, and, it, and it's been a very powerful uh, tool. Um, and and I, I loved the uh, intentional integrity uh, approach uh, that uh, Rob uh, talked about, um, and, it, and his book on the topic is, is, uh, is excellent, full of great stories about how uh, eBay and Airbnb have managed to, uh, to create these uh, and to embed ethics really in the uh, DNA of, of these firms. Uh, so, so trust really at the heart uh, of these uh, platform ecosystems. Now, part of the governance 
is about the fair, uh, fairness and the, the fair exchange of value between all the participants. And Sasha Michaud uh, hinted about how Glovo uh, is baking that into it, it, its trust processes to make sure that everybody uh, is, is fairly, fairly paid. Now, uh, overall, uh, all these governance principles are, are, are critical and, and they are linked to regulation in some ways because these principles could actually, uh, these internal code of conduct could actually be used as uh, maybe the basis upon which regulators can start thinking uh, about the regulation of platforms. So governance is, is, is a key building block. Uh, I'd like to thank, of course, all the panelists and, of course, Azim uh, Azar, who's masterfully moderated this panel uh, and who is no stranger to, to tech and, and, and platforms. And if you don't follow his uh, Exponential View newsletter, you, you should, because it's an excellent read. Now, the panel before was about regulation. Uh, so regulation is very topical. We, we keep hearing about uh, the new regulations potentially for platforms. The European Commission has just announced details of its uh, antitrust proceedings against uh, Amazon uh, yesterday. Uh, it's about the sharing of data between the marketplace and the uh, uh, e-commerce operations, for example. And, uh, and the European Commission is about to publish some, some draft uh, proposed regulations in, only in a couple of weeks time. So this is probably one of the, the most fundamental uh, shift in in the platform world that we are uh, we are going to see, um, and uh, at its best, regulation of course can can help unlock trust and can uh, enhance competition or preserve competition, and stimulate innovation. So we we all want that, but um, I think it was interesting to also listen to uh, uh, to Oliver uh, when he highlighted the fact that it's also very important to understand the rules of the game and who is going to be uh, regulated and, and what are the, uh, the, the principles that will end up in uh, that regulation, what will be allowed, because what we don't want is uh, clearly to create friction and undermine uh, the innovation uh, within uh, the, the, the markets. Uh, so we had a critical uh, point uh, and uh, Tom Smith will probably uh, uh, be able to tell us more after he's given his advice, uh, formal advice to the, to the government um, and, uh, and how uh, the regulators, the new regulators, we're going probably to see new regulators and uh, new digital regulators to look after our platforms uh, in the years to come. Now, uh, one thing that I, uh, I often worry about a little bit and, and Professor Michael Jacobides uh, hinted about that, is, is that in some uh, circles, uh, the, the, you've got politics shaping regulation in a way that uh, is, is probably not uh, not as healthy as it, as it should. So it's not the, the real competition concerns that are driving regulation, but it's uh, political considerations and, dare I say it, in some uh, cases, uh, protectionism, uh, which is probably not what we want to end up with. So thank you also to all the, all the panelists and, and Lewis Crofts, who did a terrific job and moderating this panel. And uh, I'm sure has got his work cut out for the next few years reporting on the regulatory developments in, in, in Brussels. Now we all started with the, with the impact panel. And the impact panel is really the reason why, why we're here. Uh, it's, uh, it shows the, uh, the importance of platforms in economic and, and social terms that importance is increasing. Uh, and these business models are relatively young. I mean, eBay is 25 years old uh, this year, and, uh, and it's one of the oldest platforms. And, uh, and we see that platforms are on track, as Law said, to intermediate probably close to a third of all economic transactions by 2025. And COVID is accelerating that uh, trend. So it was very interesting to see how resilient the platforms have been. Uh, I mean, they don't defy gravity, as, as Joe said, you know, in some sectors, uh, times are tough, but platforms are incredibly resilient. And this resilience also helps the communities they serve. Uh, so, you know, only, you know, 10, 15 years ago, maybe the, the same pandemic uh, would, have, would have had a far worse impact on many sectors of the, of the economy. So platforms can really, uh, really help. And, and it's not just about product platforms. Uh, Libert uh, talked uh, about... Uh, content and, and education, ed tech as a sector, and how much um, we're shifting structurally, I believe, towards a, a world where e-learning and upskilling uh, is going to be uh, done you know, online and is going to be part of all our lives. Now, 
Joe, of course, as as as, a, as an investor, uh, deployed uh, literally hundreds of millions in, in tech in, across Europe, and has got lots of platforms in his in his portfolio. Uh, and in some cases, when when the firms in his portfolio are not platforms, they are supporting platforms. So uh, Miracle is not itself a platform; it's a software company, but it enables uh, lots of platform businesses, including and this is a trend we are seeing uh, more and more uh, traditional firms that are adding a platform to their existing. Uh, business model. So, uh, and, and Jennifer, of course, I'd like to, to thank Jennifer for moderating this panel. Uh, she knows a thing or two about digital transformation and she is editor in chief of the innovator uh, that is uh, dedicated to digital transformation. Now, I would like to thank, of course, uh, all our panelists, all our moderators, uh, as well as all the people at Launchworks and Co who've made this event uh, possible and have. Uh, worked with us uh, today and in the weeks that led to, to the event. Uh, I'm sure I will forget uh, people, but uh, Petra Young, uh, uh, of course, our Master of Ceremony today, uh, but also Robin, Loki, uh, Justin, uh, Dan, Francois, Richard, uh, and Laure, who was the uh, architect and co-chair uh, of the event as well. Lastly, I'd like to thank Louise Planta, uh, who has illustrated uh, the panels today with, with talent and, and humor. Uh, and um, we will see uh, at the end, I will leave you a, a few minutes with uh, the animation of all the uh, drawings that sum up uh, all these panels. Now, uh, it was great to have everybody. So I'd like to thank everybody who logged in as well as uh, our sponsor. I mean, we, we like to keep these events free. So I'd like to thank Google uh, on this occasion for sponsoring the event. And uh, I will leave you with the, the illustrations from, uh, from Louise Plantin. Fear not, uh, we've got lots of other uh, plans. There is a woman platform leader. There is a, uh, other events that we are planning. So we, you will be hearing from us in the days, weeks, and months to come. But in the meantime, I will leave you with Louise Plantin's illustrations. Thank you again, and see you soon. Mm -hmm.